Welcome back to the quarterfinals, guys. I'm super excited for this next matchup after their amazing performance yesterday against the Knights. The Renegades have done so, so well, and they are ready to play, I'm sure. NIP, no slouches of their own, but of course, I'm joined here by Chris. Yeah, this set, this set I've, been, I've been pretty excited to see it after how the Renegades were. I think after getting that win and... and I think they kind of lost some steam mm. on Thursday before, and that might that led to the, the loss right. later. But I'm excited for this. We've seen them improve throughout. The last time these teams matched up, it was a 4-2 in NIP's favor. But Renegade's taking two maps. If they continue that upswing, yeah. it could be a very close set. Yeah, those, I guess the sort of sleeping giants, I would suppose, especially when they have such explosive wins over these Titans like Pittsburgh Knights, like Na'Vi. I mean, this is absolutely an amazing, amazing look for the Renegades. But once again, NIP, we haven't seen them for a while, really. I mean, once again, a lot of these top four teams that already qualify the top four spots just completely blew past that qualifier bracket. And, of course, NIP, I'm sure, did not just rest on their laurels. I am positive that they are ready to try and dominate today. Well, they've definitely been here. They have been scrimming. I know we kind of saw them around occasionally during the qualifier bracket just trying to get into a booth to be able to practice i know alex hasn't been shaving so i don't think he's been home <laughs> his beard is as as strong as ever for sure as we're about to see and nip they've been finally on the upswing after that very long decline yeah they're finally i think getting back to the form they were at before and that's scary for rng because all these players so flexible so strong alex specifically when we talk about flexible he can play almost anything for them and it really has opened up the draft so much for nip yeah, it's absolutely insane taking a look at just the, I mean, the perspective that they had at first. Once again, I'm glad that you brought that up. They weren't looking too good throughout the split. I mean, they were struggling for sure, but then they slowly saw their rise back to power and their dominance, and you can't sleep on them anymore. I mean, they lost they, they lost to quite a few teams, but once again, Alex, as a player, as well as NIP, they definitely have been practicing and they are ready to play again. And they've made a lot of kind of innovations in the meta that have grown over time. Buck being one that I think they're the kind of the initiators of that a lot of teams have picked up since then, but it's a great look for them. Let Alex not take so many resources, put as many as you can into tenor, have that hyper carry kind of work out. And I think NIP just realizing the roles they need to play, being so strong in those roles, has been a part of their kind of recline. Mm -hmm. It's been what's helped them claw back from the massive slump they were in before. And they were talking, I know in their interview, they're talking about peaking. Mm -hmm. at HRX. So that, that's what they were kind of waiting for. They're saying, oh, it doesn't matter how we do now because as long as we're at our peak performance, when we make it to this point, that's all that matters to us. And right. this is going to be a big test of how close to that peak they are. Yeah, it definitely is. Once again, I mean, NIP slowly falling off, but making their rise back to power. Yeah. And I'm glad that you brought up that interview, too. I mean, they had it seemed like they really had reached their peak or at least are trying to get up to that point that they want to be at. And once again, this is definitely the game to be able to do it. And I know that sounds weird, especially since their opponents, the Renegades, you wouldn't think they would be able to put up the fight they did. But after their performance against the Knights earlier in the split, also against their performance against Not As Fincere, they have to be ready to go. They have to be ready to play to try and take it over NIP. And you got to remember that this is this is a Renegade team that just 3 0 the Knights a couple days right. ago. And the Knights just beat and beat Navi. Yeah. Like literally about a couple hours ago. So keeping that in mind, this is a team that I think has explosive potential. Oh, oh and they're collectors oh. too. They have Let's the go. rare Cus Cutie <laughs> trading card. I'm very happy. <laughs> Hopefully Hero can maybe use that to strengthen their play over time. But we'll see what what RNG we're going to see here. But I know someone who is going to perform for sure, no matter what Shadow, renegades yeah. we see, and that's gonna be Shadow. Yeah, it's going to be so, so important, dude, for him to be able to pop off. But once again, literally, how how can he not? I mean, between him and Invocal, the two of them have just been so, so strong, dude. I mean, like, we've seen them on the double bank, uh, the, the double flank before. That well, I might as well call it double bank based off of how many kills they're getting. Those credits continually piling up between the both of them, dude. I mean, Shadow and Vocal, they are so, so strong. You cannot sleep on these two because they work together so well. Renegades do as a team but it all comes down to how these guys can perform. Shadow's also a player that I think had a very rough start to season three. I think he was he was brand new to PPL, more or less. He, he came in to sub in for Loki. No one was even sure if it was going to be a permanent thing. Right. But as he played, rough start to the phase, got better and better, had some highlight games, some games where he didn't perform too well. But he has grown so much playing with this team. In Vocal and Shadow, it really, they really are one of the scariest DPS lines in, in the entire league. Mm. 
no matter what, no matter how the rest of their team performs, they always make something happen. Right. They always get at least a couple points. Whether, you know, let's say they, they try to push with Moon. If Moon gets overpowered or something, they always trade a kill or two right. off of that. It's so scary to play against them because you never know what they're going to do. Right, exactly. You never know how they're going to perform, and that is literally can be the scariest thing, especially yeah. going up against a team like this. Once again, I mean, this is it you lose you go home you win you keep on moving forward you get your ticket to be able to actually participate in hrx at dream hack atlanta next week and it's going to be extremely important to see if the renegades can really do that i mean nip as well i'm sure neither team are underestimating each other doesn't matter what seed they were or what position they were in the split it all comes down to this yeah, we're going to have to see how these teams handle the pressure, too. Fawn was just saying, I mean, it, it's do or die. Right. And how these teams handle that is going to be differently. We saw last year, Worlds, it was a different roster, but NIP in the quarterfinals, they fell to SSG. That NIP was a team with, with Cruncy on the main call that we were kind of expecting to go pretty far. Rumors about how good they were coming in kind of fell apart. Is that the same NIP we're going to see here? Is this the, the quarterfinal Flandering Navi? Or are we going to see the Phase 1 PPL dominant, never dropping a map all the way to the the end NIP we're not gonna know until we finally get to see how they play nerves can always be a thing that yeah. can literally affect anyone like it doesn't matter if you're at the very very top or at the very very bottom everyone can be subject to mistakes and that's going to factor in a lot between both of these teams I mean not just who can make more mistakes that might cost their team the potential win but who is going to be the one that's going to show up to get to, to to show up today because like yeah. you said nip doing really really well in the past is that who's going to show up today or are we going to see the renegades that have been able to stop nas vincier and yeah. the likes of pk all around and all around the same split and in the same week at the times i mean hero fr from his room in our apartment sounds sounded very excited so i'm having a feeling that they've been doing well in practice <laughs> we'll see if that carries over for sure ascension warders two of the band splits are i'm sure was banned by nip yeah. I, I, I i missed the first band because i was Getting my my thing ready, but mm -hmm. Splitstone, I'm assuming from NIP. Where do they where do they want to go? Is the right. question. I think it's NIP's first pick. They have a lot of maps that I think they tend to favor. Frog, Frog Isle. Isle is going to be where they want to start. Sniper centric, kind of a basic map mm -hmm. in the sense that you have a tank in each lane, you have a DPS overlooking. All the roles are very set in stone. Yeah, that's I think that's good for NIP for sure. It, it gives them a, li a little bit. Less flexibility, but they're, I've already talked about how they're so good at playing their roles that having it so kind of locked down can help them, I think, get a really solid draft. Well, they already start off their bands, respectively, with one sniper on IP side, another sniper on Strix's side. I mean, on RG's side, but Strix is the one that's going to end up getting banned. You get rid of both of the snipers. Now, you have a little bit of flexibility to see who it is you want to ban. Do you want to try and give yourself the power tank? You're going to try and force RNG to do something in terms of the ban phase that might make them a bit uncomfortable, and they are. They are going to try and leave at least one of those power tanks to them, and we'll have to see how our RNG are going to respond. Looks like they're going to be giving them a Koa, Probably. which means they they have a, a counterplay of some kind you in mind. Makoa. They're going to need it to play against Diggy yeah. Dogs, Makoa on the other side. Renegades now. Couple options here. They, I don't know if they want to, I don't know what they'd want to grab here. Maybe both point tanks just to deny them that. Mm -hmm. But then they can get IO. Bees is having a little bit of fun with the camera. <laughs> if it's any indication over this week, he is clearly very comfortable on the other side of that yeah. lens from this. Bees kind of bringing a positive vibe to NIP. Hopefully that might help them for their sake if things start going poorly, if Renegades do start off on the right foot here. Frog Isle though. A lot of things you can run. There's a lot of good picks. I think Drogo's might be something Renegades want to grab now before NIP can take it. Having that combustible displacement, having that Dragon Punch to kill the Makoa during Ancient Rage, that could be something that helps turn the tides in their favor. Yeah, and it's going to mean a lot for sure. I mean, you got the Makoa, the NIP are really just locking in first. RNG are really, really thinking about who they want to go for. And the Willow. Them Eevee as well. How do you feel about that being locked My in for Nicole's first two? I honestly think I'd rather have Drogo's on this map. But I guess it, I guess it makes sense. Eevee for aggression, Willow just for pure spam and lockdown. I just think Willow struggles unless she has Faith Light against the Makoa. Yeah. I don't think she's mobile enough to avoid getting hooked. At the very apex of the Flutter, you are so easily hooked mm -hmm. that I, I think it might just be too easy for for uh, NIP Diggy on that Makoa to be able to make it work. Yeah. What's NIP's response going to be? I, I would probably take my other tank and my support here. I see no reason to take either of my DPSs since Renegades already grabbed two. And that means that NIP have a lot of flexibility remaining and also left 
open for them. That's yeah. going to be a lot, especially coming into these next couple of picks. That is going to mean so much, all due to the fact that, once again, you said it already, Kresnik, you've got your double blaster, you've got your two characters already, double DPS locked in first, and that's going to leave a lot to be desired with NIP's draft. Yeah, no IP. Probably going to go both tanks and a support. Like I said, no reason to rush another DPS pick. You can take your time, adapt to the tank support that they want to be bringing out. I'm assuming we can see possibly a Genos on the other side. I think that would make the most sense, especially if you're going with Barrack. And if they go Barrack Genos here, then that also gives them a lot of flexibility. I was going to say to go triple DPS, but it looks like they don't want it. I don't know about Ash into Makoa Khan, though. I feel like that's just asking to get toyed with by I the enemy tanks. Well, I mean, that is what they Stay want to lock in against the Makoa, against the Khan. They Me want to be able to give Moonchopper this Ash. Barrack, of course, being up. a hero, is going to be able to take that point tank Barrack. Now, what as NIP? I mean, you've got a field day. I mean, you've got the Drogos. You could potentially even go at Cassie if you wanted to as well. I wouldn't be shocked if Victor followed up. That too. Honestly, Victor, I think, just so free-firing. Maybe Cassie, just so they can deal with the Eevee a little bit better. Uh, Victor, Cassie, Leon, all in the, in yep. the cards. But Victor is going to be what they want. They want that raw damage instead to be able to deal with that Willow the most effectively when she goes up in that Fae Flight because neither of the tanks really have a great answer to it. Again, I really wish Renegades had actually grabbed Drogos and then maybe left themselves flexible. But with that Mave ban, I think they, they just saw too much value in Eevee. If there's any DPS line that's going to play double Blaster, though, it's going to be Renegades. And Vocal has right. been the arguably the best Kneel. on Blaster in the past, and arguably the best on Backline today. We, we've had both of those up for contention, so definitely a great team to have running double Blaster. Yeah, we're going to see what they're going to try and round things out with. It's going to be the Genos is what they're thinking about. This is what RNG want to be able to do, or this is what it seems like they want to be able to do by hovering this Genos. But once again, it's still up in the air. I mean... I would expect it. Yeah, I, I, I would expect it too at this point to be able to try and provide some healing to the Barry Ash. They can live a little bit longer than others, especially with their shielding. Stand. Yeah, that is what they're going to go with. They're literally just going to go with the Genos. I mean, that's not surprising considering it's it's RNG. This is a team that plays a Nora with Genos, right. which some other teams avoid, like the Plague. I mean, they're, they're willing to take Nando. They're willing to go all double off tank instead of having a point tank. And those are teams that normally prioritize it very heavily. So definitely not surprising there. They have a couple combos with it. They have a certain dominance. They have Ice Storm. A lot of options there, but I think the tank strength on NIP's side is just going to be too much to handle. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that, man, but this is it. NIP versus RNG. Who will take the first game? Let's toss it down to your caster so they can get us ready. Thank you very much, guys, down here for our third quarter final of the day. One more spot will be filled by the end of this one. NIP versus Renegades. This has been all NIP all year. One game went six. All of the other ones only went four for NIP. Yeah. Gore, you and I already casted one upset today. This might and be, we're getting another. This no, one might be on the same level if Renegades were able to pull it out. I feel bad because I just did that to Blake and their poor ears back there. Either way, it's going to be interesting to see what we get out of Renegades. I mean, they were able to surprise us Thursday by beating the Knights. We know we have that they have it in them, right? But yes, it's whether or not they show up again. NIP have been incredibly confident pretty much all week and very happy knowing that their opponents were going to be Renegades today. So Five, maybe falling in that area of three, if they two, come in too cocky, they one. might the fly too close begin. to the sun and end up falling. We'll have to see. I think a lot of it depends less on NIP's level of play and more on I what agree. Renegades we get today. I mean, we've seen some, quote, off NIP this, uh, this year. But, oh, yes. but there's still there's still kind of a level of consistency there. I agree, though. It depends what Renegades show up to play. And unfortunately, right now, Shadow's not going to be able to do so. Back in base for five or so more seconds. And IP right back onto the point. 42% for them and a good zone in place. They went double blaster into a Leon. That's dangerous if Bittner starts heating up. Well, he's getting aggressive. Diggy Dog right here waiting for the hook. Going to be able to grab him. That's exactly what you want out of this. They're up 81% nothing. Someone needs to be able to get in there and maybe it's cause hero. some more objective control for him. But yeah, Hero finally kind of moves in. It feels like Renegades just haven't been able to Ooh, get nice into shot. this until just now. There's a good turn shot onto Bittner, and that could be what opens the door here for the Renegades. Half health bars kind of across the board. You lose some of that long range confirm if you're NIP, but you get yourself 81%, so a good lead for them on the point as they look to fight right back into it. No ultimates immediately ready here, but you're starting to get yeah. to that high 80. 
Soon to be low 90 mark. Could be a difference maker. Very well might be here. Dragon Punch going to be coming up soon. Might be the one that's the most immediately noticeable for what could happen and what could change around here. Nice. Nightman came out. Bittner's able to get two. Trades his life out for it. And that 81 has been matched and passed now by Renegades. Yeah, Renegades very in control of this mid now. Two for two trade is how it goes. Hook out, but Diggy Dog is too low. Moon Chopper drops down the assert dominance just to maybe counter out that Dragon Punch. And Alex is not able to connect onto anybody. Gets the kill the old-fashioned way onto Viral. As Shadow's able to find the kill, but right back onto the point goes Bonker. Grabs the overpower, sends Moon Chopper flying. Faith Flight for Invocal immediately shot down by Bittner, who has rejoined the fight on the back line. Ice Storm is not going to be enough. Hero maybe through the failsafe, but a double kill from the Leon. And somehow, NIP fight back. Bittner here to remind you why he is one of the top players in the league. Well played from him. Good shots. 5-2-1. and one. Top damage after just one mid-fight. Granted, it's a little long of a mid-fight, but still, only one happens. Actually managed to charge his ult up technically twice throughout yeah, that run. So well played from him. And you get him with Diggy in front of him on Makoa. It is just a clean slate yep. for these guys to feel comfortable. And we've seen Frog Isle. This is a snowballing map. This corner is usually your best bet at trying to find a hold. But if nothing big comes out of the Renegades soon, this payload's going to be going downhill towards the Convergence Point fast. Bittner gets one more confirm with that Enlightenment, so it's already back to 68% with a kill to boot. Too far backwards goes Alex. Shadow sliding down the map. Blink, not enough. And down he goes as Diggy Dog grabs that kill. So now payload inching itself much quicker, I think, than the Renegades were expecting. A zone is in. They're going to be able to get out, use the rocket boots to get back in range. Hero drops down the dome shield. Buys a little bit of time for himself as Diggy Dog Shell spins out Moon Chopper. Well, poking away, but now Ancient Rage, you got too many targets on too many different sides, and Diggy Dog grabs the kill, and now Hero back behind his shield. Has to rocket boots away one last time. Not sure he has the failsafe up, though. Diggy Dog gets the kill onto and Vogel double kill now as he turns around onto Hero. That's all they need, and they make it too. Well played from NIP again. I think the aggression that comes out from this Makoa just opens doors wide. If you're not looking at him, then you are trying to look at Bidner, but unfortunately, he's back there doing well, exactly this over and over again. The Enlightenment coming up as much as it has as well. It's a big burst, 1,600, that they just don't know how to handle. And I think each time so far he's thrown it out, he's gotten a kill with it as well. So showcasing the 50% recharge on it has been perfect. And that was uh, the beginning of this last highlight was kind of my uh, my thoughts on the way this draft ended up going. I mean, I think Double Blaster can work here on Frog Isle, but I mean, do you think if Bittner's just playing too consistently and Eevee and a Will are going to have too hard a time? I think that's part of what it is. I think Invocal doesn't really have a place to, to stay that feels safe, right? He can't get the damage out. Very good presence against the point, so he can cause trouble for Bonker, but if you have a Makoa coming up on the side, Drogo's poking you down, and then a Leon finishing you off, well, you don't really have a safe place to stand. Although I will say that's the second Dragon Punch yep. now that has not found its way. So maybe opening the door for a good Faith Flight if Invocal can find that open. They used the Dread Serpent as well, neither of which buying them too much, but they do have a point lead. Bonker lifts up Hero, and they are able to burn him down. Doesn't toss him off the map. Gets enough damage to clean him up. Shadow just plugging away some shots into the backside of Bonker here, and that's enough damage to finally clean up the Khan. He never turned around to address the threat here in this moment. One last shot from Shadow onto Birds. All he needs, but instead Bird stays alive, dances back. Ice block, he goes. Bittner gets the kill. And now the dominoes beginning to fall for NIP. Moonchopper back behind the shield. Might not be enough to stay alive. And gets a stun there as well. That was nice. Bird just being able to kind of peek, stun, go back. Keep himself alive. The anti-flank in Bittner on Leon was able to play a huge role in keeping that alive. And Bird is on the edge of death for what felt like forever. In that yep. engagement, being able to get saved and come out alive is huge for them. They get point number three here. Six and a half minutes into game one. It has been all NIP all day. They don't show any signs of stopping here. Not with Moonchopper getting burnt down. He does have to back up to the shield. Once that expires, so does he. Now if you're the Renegades, the nightmare start where NIP are knocking on the door of a 4-0, six and some change minutes into this game. And it's definitely not good for morale. We've seen the Renegades, a lot of their wins have to come back, or on the back of them being able to kind of rally around something, around each other even. 
And a 4 0 loss to start off the day. Granted, it's Frog Isle. Maybe they can brush it off that way, but it's definitely not going to be good for their mental fortitude. They're going to have to do a lot to swing around from this one. And it all starts right here. They need to do whatever they can, and it starts with a Faith Flight. The Faith Flight is where they'll need to find some value. Dome Shield as well, kind of defensively way in the back of the map there. And the moment they step out, they're starting to get burnt down. Now Invocal finds the moment to move forward. Another stun from uh, from Bird, excuse me, was enough to lock up Invocal, but Invocal pops right back up and starts getting some kills. So they're still alive, but Bonker way in the back of the Renegade's base. And doing exactly what you would expect a flank to do on this map, more than a front line. He's getting in their face, does end up kind of paying for it with his life. But, I mean, he was back there distracting. He was making Viral kind of circle around so he couldn't pay full attention to the game. And I believe he even got a kill or two while he was back there. Just kind of keeping everyone on Renegades on their toes. A lot of the pressure, though, is kind of driven behind the Leon. I think Alex is doing really well, but Bittner's the one securing the kills. The tanks get up there, get aggressive. Once Bittner's gone, you can keep it going, but you're more holding, not pushing. Right. Now with Bittner back, everyone respawn. They're back in the same zone to potentially close this out in the next 30. Well, Renegades, the time is now to defend. Bittner snipes Moon Chopper out of the sky before the Assert Dominance can drop down. Shadow's able to trade out onto Alex. That's an important moment for the Renegades on this defense. Hero caught out from the rest of his team. He drops as well. You might just be putting all of your cards on this Eevee at the end of this game. Payload inching itself ever closer. No Hero for five or five or so seconds. Diggy Dog shell spins right back out. Back to safety. Hook in. Shadow cleaned up. Payload moving onward. Bittner now getting aggressive, looking for the last few shots. The Enlightenment connects for a double kill. Bonker grabs one as well. And now it's the half-health hero trying to stay alive. Assert dominance. It rings down, but Moon Chopper is going to get staggered out maybe a little bit from the rest of his team here. Once that assert dominance wears out, things become a lot more difficult. Blink in, blink out from Shadow. NIP, now it's in their end. You can't be giving up anybody. Payload about to go in, but it doesn't connect. Dread Serpent doing whatever he can. Bonker just trying to stay alive, and that's enough. And wow, towards the end there, it looks like the Renegades maybe are going to be able to pull out a defense, but NIP, they get that Dread Serpent charged up right at the right time. And a 4-0 to start this one off on Frog Isle. A dream start for NIP, a nightmare start for the Renegades. Yeah, it's exactly what they would have expected. Bees just walked by and made probably the happiest face. Yeah. I don't know, he's a pretty happy guy, so I can't say that I've ever seen on him. But compared to the rest of NIP who are in there just like, yeah, there's another day in the park. Like, they just... Yeah. No emotion on those guys' face. They just come in, they do the job, they get out. And well, this time they did the job, it was a 4-0. And like you said in the past, the closest this set has been is a 4-2 in their favor. Otherwise, 4-0, 4-0, 4-0 for the first three times they met this year. They definitely feel like it yeah. might just be another checkbox on their way to a championship. And Bees was in the booth dancing and singing before game one even kicked off. So you know what kind of mood he is in today. That's exactly how he, he expected game one to go. Renegades, they're looking for a bounce back in game two right after this. A good game, but NIP are the ones that are going to end up taking it over the Renegades with a 1-0, a very, very dominant game from NIP as well. Once again, you gave them the Makoa. The draft on the, on the Renegades side was a little bit weak, Kresnik, so hopefully they can fix that in this game. Yeah, it, I, some of the fights were one-sided, but I don't really know if I agree with it. I think giving them Makoa is fine, but you have to get an answer. Yeah. Willow and Eevee's not... 
isn't an answer. Mm-hmm. When you have your Fae Flight, you can kind of buy some time a little bit, but giving up Makoa Khan, I think, is, is just too much, especially when they have Leon and Drogos to back it up. You can tell on these damage charts, Tenor and Alex, very high up there. I, I think if Renegades had had Drogos, this, this game could have looked very different. Yeah, I think it could have, too. And the slash lines and Renegades looking rough as ever. And NIP on the flip side of that, look, it's still pretty Pretty good. 10 and 5 for Alex, 13 and 4 for Bidner. Even Burt only dying once that game, having 16 assists, most in the game, 6, 4, and 9, 4, 4, and 14. But Burt, actually, we, we don't really highlight the supports often, but I, I think it's always important to bring them up because of the fact of, like, check this out. Like, check how his he survivability lives. here, yeah. And the fact that his team was able to come back and save him, too. Right. The kill by Tenor on Shadow was super impactful. Getting away from Moon Chopper here with a perfect dive and keeping Diggy alive. Also, that fear basically won them that fight. Yeah, th they were sustaining for a really long time because of Bird's heals on the con here. He with the assert dominance, managed to keep Bonker alive, keep him up, and is charging this Dread Serpent during this chaotic fight. Won them won them the game. Feared yeah. three people away from the objective in the last moments. Everyone was panicked touching, but this Dread Serpent just was perfectly timed. Mm -hmm. Perfectly timed and perfectly played by NIP to close out that round. So once again, they're looking pretty good so far in this set, but this is a best of seven longer than we've seen throughout the rest of this week. This gives people more of a chance to try and fight back, find their find their crux, find out what it is that's not causing them to be able to try and close out these games. The Renegades have more games to go. I want Renegades to draft a little bit. They don't, they don't need to draft exclusively to counter NIP, but I want them to find that middle ground between drafting what you want and an answer for what the enemy team's bringing, because I think... Mm. They could have had some answers if that's what they were looking for. Well, we'll have to see if the answer might be in the form of a map, and it'll be Ice Mines is where the Renegade will want to go to see how the to just to see how RNG are going to try and respond with this. We'll see what they want to do on Ice Mines. We know the kind of map that this is. Definitely a way to flip the momentum on its head after the Snowbally Frog Isle and Renegades immediately have clearly done some level of homework and so yep. have NIP. Pip, ban, BK ban. Yeah. Already starting off with the target bans for both sides. They get rid of the Makoa this time. They don't want to leave him open. RNG, though, are going to leave themselves at 0 to one NIP, once again, having taken the previous game on Frog Isle, for those of you just tuning in, RNG are going to have to find the momentum, try and fight back, especially since they've gotten rid of the Pip, they got rid of the Makoa. No more power tanks in the game because NIP have banned Atlas and VK. This would be a, a decent place, I think, to first pick Willow, and they will. I think this is a good choice for Ice Mine specifically. So much AoE zone control, dead zone seedlings, her left click in general. All does so much to keep a team out. Although a couple blasters are still available. Drogos for NIP. If they don't take it here, I could even see a Willow Drogos game, honestly, from Renegades. They could do double blaster again, because NIP would kind of be locked out of it. Yeah. Still some good hits cans open. I'm sure NIP are going to take Strix here. Wouldn't be shocked to see Strix and Khan. Maybe coming out from NIP, two very powerful picks that are kind of left on the table. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, it really all comes down to that. How will NIP try and manipulate their draft? Because Willow's going to be extremely strong. I mean, once again, it's literally a matter of life or death coming into these next couple sets throughout the day. Willow's a good character. So, I mean, I feel like you definitely have your opportunities there to try and be creative, especially on Ice Mines where you can get hit by so many different blaster characters. And Con Ash, is this a potential IO? Possibly, but I think I you want Ying or Genos on this map for Stay dismounts. Close and okay. follow my I think that's kind of big. And this means that NIP are willing to give up Strix to Renegades. And I think that means that NIP thinks that Con Ash is the answer to Strix. On a map where the mid fight is pretty close, closely put together, you might be able to just rush straight in with that Con Ash, make up the distance. Yes, Strix can still burst you for full damage, and honestly, it's even easier for him to hit you at point blank range. Right. But in fact, you can actually trade back damage, unlike when Strix is playing his distance. Wouldn't be surprised to see Aaron Negate still take it, though. Such an impactful pick. A Strix and a, and a support, I think, would be two very solid lock-ins here. Barrack going to be what is hovered at the moment. Denying triple tank from NIP, and triple tank wouldn't be too surprising. And they're the actually game. going with the Ying instead. They want to get the sustainy support and the one that's good at dismounting the enemy team. So with that being Cut said, what do you think RNG Bob. draft for an off tank? Do you see the ruckus being a potential here Time for Moon Chopper, charge. or what? What should they be I looking think it for? It has to be right. It's unfortunate, but Mo I, Moon's hero pool isn't really that big. Mm -hmm. With Makoa, Atlas, Han, Ash all picked. I think it has to be Ruckus. Mm -hmm. It's that, or I think they could go maybe na go in Nora and then put Moon on Barrack. Moon has played Barrack before. It is something that they have in the table, but you definitely want your Barrack to be your point tank. NIP. Mm -hmm. Still a couple picks left. Barrack Ying, kind of surprising for me, but 
I, I understand why. I mean, having NIP Con Ash Barrick with Tenor on Barrick is it really is a terrifying triple tank lineup yeah. for them. And Damba, they don't want the dismount, which is kind of surprising to me. They have the aggressive composition. They want to be denying space from the other side of the map. Yeah, I mean, well, they've got the Victor Pray though to be able to, to your be gods. coupled with the that. Spirits and Victor not. are likely going to Bittner once again. I mean, this is going to be Literal really, really incoming. strong regardless. I mean, we saw how Invocal played the Victor yesterday mm -hmm. against the Knights. Those grenades, his positioning really set up so much for them, specifically on Ice Mines as well, the same map. We know the presence that Victor can have, and when you give it to somebody like Bittner, it's going to be twice as strong for sure. Yeah, and the Victor will be pretty powerful, I think, into the barrack as well because of the size of the head hitbox. Headshots, super, super powerful. I just wanted to mention that I talked about the support meta, Ying Genos. The reason why those two are the most picked is, is because of those dismounts. You want to, you can spam through that gate at the start, and you can get knock the enemy off of their horses and not let them go too far ahead. That's kind of why we've seen Domba fall off in this map. That's why we're not seeing Grover mm -hmm. as much because even though Grover's healing is amazing on this map, missing out on the dismounts, just giving up all that positioning just because you don't have a hit scan support, is kind of what led to that change in the support meta. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've got Eevee, you've got a Nara. How are you feeling if you're NIP if this is what you're looking at right of the now? Wild. I, I'm, I'm not super happy, just because right. Nara Barrack is pretty solid. It, not, not particularly because it's a hard counter to what I have. I think Victor is really solid into a Nara Barrack. But having double point tank on this map where you can just lock down the sides, if you can poke better than Ooh. them, it can help a lot. Speaking of poke, Dredge. Is this what we're going to see in quarterfinals? I, I feel like we always just get troll hovers of Dredge. This yeah. is a map where you can actually play it, though. This is a map where we've seen it more really? than once. Let's and go! we are going to see it in the quarterfinals. NIP reliant Let's on go. this Dredge. And this is a fantastic comp to play it into. They don't have the pressure to get into him. There's going to be so much spam from this Dredge that Renegades can't really answer. Wow, man. A Dredge being brought out in the quarterfinals of NIP versus the Renegades. You know it. You love it. The Pirate is Do here. Do I love it? The left I mean, yeah. I, I love it. I love playing it. I mean, when have you... Well, if you're the Renegades, you don't love it. Yeah, no, no. You, you hate it. You hate, you, it. You hate it if you're You hate Renegades. it if you're the Renegades. You love it if you're NIP. You love it if you're us. And it's going to be really good on Ice Mines. Oh, yeah. I talk about how good zoning is on this map. What character can keep up with Willow in terms of explosive zoning? It's Dredge. Yeah. I mean, not picked at all during the split. Not picked at all during the regular seasons. is not qualifiers, but we see him brought out here in the quarterfinals. I'm not going to wait for any longer. The Pirate is here, baby. Game two. Let's go. And the Pirate, it's on the table, and it's here for NIP. They're looking to forge him into victory. Renegades, they they pivot back to the, the double kind of blaster composition. It's a map where it can work. Aggressive zoning, as Kresnik put it, very important here on Ice Mines. But Dredge, it's got to be the topic going into game here. Gore, how do you like him? I love Dredge, period. I think I like him most on this map. He has a very specific kind of play style, and he only fills in a very specific kind of role. But he's going to be able to do all of those right here. You can see Scuttle. So now his reload is much like a Moldamba reload where he shoots something out except instead of a stun this time it's going to be an explosion and dark bargain five is probably the most important thing along with hangman's iron healing while his shortcuts nearby giving him a shield when he gets low it's three seconds 600 health all of these things are going to help keep him alive just in general played at the right angle not only a lot of deniability in terms of the space he brings yep just pure explosive damage is insane oh well, he gets it done with the harpoon there. That's first blood onto Hero. Renegades have to pull all the way back under the duress of Alex, kind of holding down this right hand flank. You can see positioning those teleporters, those little snowy stars on the sides of these rooms. While he's next to him, he's going to get some healing. And if he's under duress, he can blink himself right back out. So the dredge up to this point, Gore, it's paid off. And it does a lot of damage. The biggest thing for me always has to come down to the fact that dredge can just tell you no, you can't stand there anymore. That reload is probably the biggest one where you'll just, all of a sudden there's a space where you just can't touch, you can't get there. Yeah. If he moves up towards window, typically where Victor stands, the point just becomes uninhabitable. If you right. are a Nara, if you're Barrack, if you're anybody who happens to be a tank, or well, if you're just trying to stand there for the fun of it on Renegades, <laughs> becomes very difficult. The biggest threat to him is probably going to be this Eevee, and as long as he keeps this kind of aggression up against her or keeps yeah. her distracted on the side, until Shadow actually gets the kill, 
that's just one less Evie that's causing trouble for the rest of his team. I guess that's the question. Do they just need to send Shadow in on that Evie, try to flank? I mean, the mobility oh, of I Evie way unmatched. More. Way more, you think? I think if you have Alex in the prime position and he can hit one to two of those grenades plus a reload before that blink back comes through, Evie only has 1,800 health. He does enough damage to kill her off. I think Shadow, in the right scenario, the right trade, can lock him down. Right. But it doesn't feel like enough so far. Alex is expecting it. He knows that sure. that's coming for him. And so it feels like you have to send something else, a little more pressure, just maybe 500 damage, really, to yeah. assist him to make sure that that goes Shadow's way. What do you think about the Renegades pivoting back to the double blaster? They did it on Frog Isle. didn't quite work, but they're trying it again here on Iceman. I don't know how I feel about it. And the thing that makes me feel worse about it here is mainly just Ice Mines isn't really an Eevee map to me. She can play everywhere. Yeah. It's not necessarily her worst map. It's not her best either, so you're coming in at a kind of middle ground for Eevee. And unless he does big things, you're just going to be thinking, man, if we had X or Y or Z, we could have done better. Yeah, I think NIP feel confident in this draft. They get the victor as well, which is so often an invocal pick here. Slow goings here for the first point fight of the game. A single kill, and that was Alex onto Hero. Got it done with the harpoon. Shadow flying around. First illusory rift of the game. Shadow actually flanks out Bittner this time and gets the first kill up onto the high ground. Out goes Alex, but back to base is his final destination as Invocal grabs a kill as well. And suddenly, NIP is in control as they were. Renegades, they find the moment to jump. And I think it's showcasing a lot of what can go wrong, and that, well, does come down to Willa. Right? You look at one blaster and you wonder what they can open. The minute Shadow stops trying to play this game with Alex, he goes 2-0-2, two, oh, two, right? He leaves the objective, is able to start picking up some kills, and that opens up room for Invocal to get aggressive. And admittedly, with how many times we've said those two names this year, that's where they win the fight the most. Because if you can get rid of Invocal, you get rid of Shadow, either or, you're usually in a good position. So Alex might not have the most, I would say, kill ability oh, nice. against them. That's a really good shot against Eevee, but... For the most part, he's looking to just harm the tanks. Yeah, he's poked out some good damage into Hero. Helps Bittner get the kill barrage. Does the double kill for the back line of NIP. This is the zone you want if you're on defense on this map. Keep things moving forward for you, backward for the Renegades. No ultimates for them to try to retake here. And this is where a dredge can pay off in dividends, this aggressive zone. Nobody from the Renegades wants to move into this space. This is also kind of why I was confused with his positioning around the objective. He's playing in the side room where, admittedly, Victor's going to take window, but most of the dredge play I've seen on Ice Mines or any time that I brought it out has always been from window. I, you don't typically see him get aggressive on the side. It's more vulnerable, plus you aren't always sure that you're going to be able to get the damage you want onto the objective without taking too much in return. This time around, though, Seems to be working out for him. Right here, you can hold this angle. Nobody can walk down the path without you know, getting caught at least a little bit. Yep. It's just the way the uh, the lobbed projectiles work. You These can Hail Marys. find any angle you want. Nobody wants to go underneath that little archway right there. This is the uh, this is the gameplay Alex said okay to. I'm going to hang around that back corner, lob out some shots, try to prevent Renegades from moving anywhere in that area. Bittner has another barrage ready if need be. And you can see how much Renegades are struggling trying to break that zone. There's so much potential damage around every corner, they can't move forward. I mean, where do you go, right? If you come around one corner, you take dredge bombs. If you go around the other corner, you're going to get hit either with a barrage or just burst mode victor. Either way, you're not happy with that damage that you're going to take. I think a lot of pressure comes down to, to Hero and Moonchopper right now to figure out what the best approach to this is. And, I think the unfortunate wow. answer for them is there isn't one. Yeah, I'm not sure there is. Hero is completely trapped out here. One last bomb connects. One more kill for the Dredge, who is on a six streak in this game. Riveting stuff from Alex, tossing out the projectiles. Just doing some zoning there. And while it's not the flashiest, most exciting play, that's why you pick a Dredge on this map, the space control. We can see, I think this is going to be his first blood, which, again, mm. good control. This just... This area can be very dangerous. That's one of the things you showed. It can be great for finding some picks. You get aggressive on it, you get around that corner, and all of a sudden, viral shadow feel pressure nice out. Shot. But a lot of these moments you notice where he is. Not in the action. Nowhere near the action. 
He loves to lob from far away. And so far, it's been working out for him. He doesn't need the kills. He doesn't need the flashy plays. Although 5, 1, and 2 means he is the flashy plays right now. But you can set it up for Bittner. You can just open the door for the rest of your team. And now he has the Kraken. But this, yeah. if I remember correctly, this is post-nerf, pre-buff yes. Kraken. So it doesn't have as much damage to it, but it does have its faster deploy time. Yes. I believe right now on this patch, it's going to be about 1,400 damage, which admittedly isn't a lot, but at the same time, it's kind of a good chunk. Could be good for an execute, depending on what targets you connected onto. It's that instant burst that you're looking at there, rounding this corner, full zone in from NIP. Stunned up, Alex takes the teleporter. Right on back to that back room. Illusory Rift used as well as the Dread Serpent Hero. Gets the kill onto Diggy Dog, so keeping themselves in this fight, but still plenty of ultimates to go for the Renegades. Kraken's still available, which in some cases might just be a get off the point for a second ultimate as it comes through, but he needs a little bit more from Alex. He's getting pressured out here. Wants to fall back. You need a little coming out of Bittner, something to get rid of that Eevee, I think, to allow Alex to get aggressive into it. He's been patient with this Kraken as well. Hasn't found the right moment for it. Does some damage, connects with a little bit there onto Shadow as well. All this time, Renegades have been garnering point percentage. Kraken finally goes out as well as the Fae Flight getting chunked down on the back line is Bonker on that con. Bittner has been alive this entire time up on the high ground. Dome Shield as well used one last time. NIP, they don't have the numbers to contest this mid fight. And the Renegades. They, they withstand this onslaught of just consistent damage. A triple kill for Invocal ties this one up as Renegades break the tie and make it 2-1. Now, honestly, I think it comes down to weird ult usage, partially from NIP, some coming out and not getting anything from them as much. But that Diggy Dog kill specifically is where the turning point pivoted for the Renegades. They were able to get rid of him, get back into the objective, and continue their fight going forward. It also doesn't help that if Alex gets pressured out, it feels like Bittner can't really contribute to the fight yep. around the point right now because the double blaster just focuses the window at that point. So you need something coming out from the rest of an IP or some, some new strategy other than let's just put Dredge in the side room. Because otherwise, Renegades are going to keep doing this over and over again. We'll see him capture the point, not push. Capture the point, potentially not push for this round, not looking too good so far. And if they just keep that round up, eventually they win. It just takes a while to get there. And this is the exact spot where the payload did not move past at the end of the last round. Renegades are going to spend the Illusory Rift to try to maybe break this hold. Kraken use. Seismic Crash does not come out for Hero. He's exploded before he's able to. And Alex gets himself a kill. Apparently, this is where this dredge feels comfortable. He's doing pretty much everything he would want to. He's loving it back here, as you pointed out. And this is where most of his kills have come from. This is where a lot of his good zone is coming from. I'm assuming any of the poke damage that he does have, probably from this area as well. Nothing crazy around the mid fight, which is where I think we need to see it come to fruition. It needs to change then, there, more than anything. As they have, what, 45 seconds left now to try and push this forward if you're yep. Renegades. Faith Flight's available soon enough. Ice Storm, Dome Shield, Seismic Crash. If you can get back onto it, if you win one fight without using too many ults, yep. you could still potentially close this out. We saw the beginning of the last push. The Renegades were able to kind of get NIP way back, kind of around that last or the, the next bend, uh, but weren't able to really capitalize on it. The space control, I mean, I, I don't know. That's the buzzword of the game here. Renegades, they need to figure out a way to get around it because there's just been so much damage pouring into these front lines. Bittner from the back line connects with a little bit of his own. So that's three for the victor set up in large part due to kind of the zoning of his team. But on the flip side, NIP, they got to figure out mid. Renegades need to figure out the push. NIP, they got to figure out the mid fight. I think a lot is going to shake out to, well, that guy actually in vocal on this Willow. It's not something I'm used to saying. It kind of feels weird to say it out loud. But he gets into this position, and this is where you cannot let him be, right? He gets the DR from using Flutter. That damage reduction helps keep him alive. He finds a good flank. Once that kill on the Bittner comes through, Alex can't do anything about it. The rest of the team can't do anything about it. Willow, well, she's one top ban for a reason. So 10, 2, and 5, 8, 2, and 5. You have great slash lines if you're Bittner and, and Alex here. You need more from your tanks. 
and you need more, more around this mid fight. Those kills yep. are coming out mostly on the defense. Yeah, I that's need true. this to change around now. That's true. There's only really been a couple of kills on these mid fights for NIP. Renegades have slow played it, controlled it. And that's fine. I mean, on Ice Mines, you can win that way. You just win four mid fights and you're good to go. Looking for their first, though, is NIP here as the barrage connects for just a little bit of damage from Bittner. Alex, very low. He's going to hang by his teleporters. Bonker stunned up. Seismic Crash drops down. Shadow double kill in this fight already. Maybe going to blink in and get aggressive. Assert Dominance goes up. Assert Dominance does come down, but Diggy Dog, he's, he's way up on the high ground right now. He didn't really lock anybody out there. He's able to poke out a little bit more damage. Just needs a couple more shots into Invocal, and he's able to find it and maybe keep this within reach, but it's already 63% for the Renegades. That turnaround might be enough, though. Everyone on NIP is going to be respawning and coming back in. They are not going to have Invocal for a little while. They don't have Bird, though, which is going to be a devastating blow. They have to do this the old-fashioned way. No healing coming down for him, and there's going to be a dome shield with a crack in it. Yeah, the Kraken spins on around, but doesn't find anything. Renegades one more time win this mid fight. Now this fight maybe just dictates which way the payload gets to move. Bittner has that barrage back off of cooldown, explodes off hero. Savage now is this victor. The Renegades have just kind of ignored him. I think this is an example of why I have said for so long that Ice Mines is a good map for the Renegades. It's one they know how to control, they know how to play it. And as much as I like the dredge. Well, Alex is just going to sit around that corner for two <laughs> minutes. and, and <laughs> This is the next two minutes of your game right here. If you're Renegades, you have to figure out how to break this down without taking too much in return. I think the, the biggest thing is this dredge is great for the defense. So far, has proven itself stellar here. But hasn't done anything on the mid fight as much as you would like. Got that first blood yeah. in the game. But it's not denying the space like I'm used to seeing. It's not denying oh, just all of Renegades the way that it should be. And if he goes down here, the one thing he had going for him is gone. There we go. Finally, some aggression from the Renegades on the push. The Illusory Rift followed up by the Fae Flight. Vocal, he adds three kills to his slash line as the payload marches on. He was 5, 6, and 6 just prior to that. So now we get to look at this dredge back against the wall and you know, as slow as this game has been and, and you know, as zony and full length of, of defense as it's been for NIP, they could lose this game. This set could be tied with a push here. Now, a lot could go wrong in the next minute. They have to figure out how they're going to defend this. If they can get a good grasp on this area just inside their base, that payload is in probably the worst position to try and contest for overtime with a dredge on the other side. I mean, he can just splash damage down there all day. And, and you're going to have a wall, you're going to have a barricade, you have shields, but they only last so long compared to, well, what is these constant shots coming down from Alex. It's a seismic crash from Hero, rains down, Alex gets the kill, using that teleporter for some sustain. Look at that health bar tick back up just a little bit. Hero's the first to fall, he's back on respawn now. It's probably going to take him the next 10 or so seconds just to get back into this fight, maybe even the full length on towards overtime. So how much can NIP buy in the meantime is the question. They only need five more. And I love the way Alex is playing this. He keeps putting down a teleporter just in front of the door so he can get out whenever he needs to. He's going to be able to get healing. He has Kraken as well. This is a good time to use it. And he found some good value for it up on the high ground. Illusory Rift. The Renegades may be looking to end this game right here, right now. Alex is the first to fall. Shadow into the ice block. Overpower, oh, but he poops his head on the spot, and Hero doesn't end up getting cleaned up, and now he's getting sustained right on through. Dome Shield dropped down from Hero as Bittner continues to fire damage in from the high ground. Trades going back and forth. Bird slithers right on past the payload, and Vocal has a double kill for himself. Alex back into this fight, trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Moonchopper on this barrack. It's not enough. The Renegades, they tie this set. And they do everything they need to in the process. And as much as I like seeing them, as fun as it can be, I think they went too fun. Again, yeah, too that close too, to the is sun. That too much? Dredge was not the answer there. I think the damage and the kill number, the slash line, are all going to make it look justified when you see it in the post-game stats. It's the point presence that it brought that is going to unjustify yeah. it. That's where it kind of fell apart. It's just points over here. He's sitting right here, corralled by an Eevee. If he gets aggressive, he dies, which happened a few times. Yep. There wasn't anything he could do, and that's the the trouble of having two people who want to be in window against this double blaster. As much as I'm still not maybe fully sold on double blaster, 
they did exactly what they needed there. And vocal go over there, shadow go over there. Everything's clear. We don't have to worry about the point. And you could see the difference when the Renegades said, all right, we've been sat around this corner getting poked out by this dredge for too long. Let's just go all at once. Faith laid a loose re rift everything, and they finally yeah. are able to convert. They tie it up. NIP versus the Renegades. We're tied at one here. One more tie-breaking game three. That's on the board right after this. match y'all we are at a tie one to one nip versus the renegades but the dredge pick though i mean once again very very high spirited for nip to try and bring that out yeah it was doing very very well on the defenses that's for sure and that's where rng managed to struggle Kresnik. but still they just kept winning those mid fights it was harder for them to try and fight back yeah and i, I think it, it has merit on the mid fight True. i mean being able to spam at the Inara Barrack, I think what it came down to is Inara Barrack Ying just out-sustains that dredge poke. He's doing yeah. damage, but what's cleaning up on it? Right. Not much of anything. Tenor, I think, did a decent job of it, but both of those characters are too... Their jobs are to deal damage. Neither of them are there to clean up on it. And you can see this viral 216,000 healing in yeah. a game that was over... It wasn't that long. No, I mean, it, it was long-ish, but not crazy long. Yeah, I mean, once again, you've got 171,000 healing on Bird's side, so once again, significantly less than what Viral was able to output. And the slash lines aren't looking, weren't looking bad on the Renegades at all, but Alex Bender between the two of them with the double digits, 10 and 6, 14 and 3. But a vocal on the Willow, man, I mean, we talk him and Shadow up a pretty... I, I, I would actually pretty say fair a, yeah, a pretty fair amount, but this is literally why we do so when they have performances like this. Yeah, I mean, Vocal flexing onto the blaster roll, doing a fantastic job, I think. Alex trying to use the knockback from the broadside to save him there, but it was not enough. And no real response to the Fae Flight if he could just stay out of line of sight of Tenor, and he did. Made it very hard for them to react. And Vocal, a lot of control over the game. That's definitely the impact that Willow has. You can lock down any area with all this damage. This Dome Shield's super impactful. Tenor in the spot. I didn't even notice that Invoca got late feared there, actually, but it wasn't enough in the end to change the outcome of that game. Yeah, they were actually able to fight super, super well and able to do what they needed to, which is partly win the game, tie it up 1-1 against NIP. Not an easy task, And but what is but here's what matters is that they've tied it up, yes. They are looking good. They looked good at ice spots, yes, but it was also against a dredge, not to take anything away from them. And they also have to make sure they carry this momentum into the next game. They cannot get stuck at this one win. And that's why I think that NIP is probably going to take us to a map that's going to kill momentum. They don't right, want Renegades sure. to be able to bring it any further than they already have. And it's kind of a tough ask, I think, for Renegades to keep it going with how NIP looked on looked on map one. And honestly, how they looked on map two, I think they were holding them pretty strong. They were. Alex, they, they had that dredge pick figured out, I think, it just wasn't into the right draft. Renegades with a good answer on the other side. It, it, it's unfortunate that they do a draft that forces Moonchopper to play Barrack. Mm -hmm. And then not only does Moon actually perform very well on the Barrack, but the rest of the draft is so they pick the one thing that gets kind of hard countered by double point tank. You right. try to bust out the dredge, and he just doesn't have the, the damage that's out that's out damaging the Inara Barrack Ying heals. Now, he was able to pretty much left click and literally just spam and cut off entire ways. I mean, they couldn't really move up. There was a lot of time, especially them coming down the hill, it was hard for them to fight yeah, back. It seemed like he was having fun. Yeah, I mean, it seemed yeah, like he, he was just, you know. 
looking at a choke point. Yeah, I mean, that's was, what Dredge does. Yeah, yeah, sure. It, 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 <laughs> he was doing a lot in terms of locking down different angles, but the, the Inar Barrack, they just rotate somewhere else, right? And not all the angles have the same coverage that Alex was able to get in that one. You saw him holding on the left, on top of his transporter, using right. it to get that expansive vault jump height boost when he got dove, but it just, it just wasn't enough at the end of the game, and Vocal was able to confirm on him mid-air when he was using the expansive vault, he had to get away from that dead zone, which was getting placed on him, and Willow just was able to force him out when push came to shove. Yeah, I mean, they have to, once again, carry this momentum that they have, and in that sense, RNG, to try and carry out more and more games that can eventually convert to wins. And you've got Bizarre, you've got a strong map, a very, very open map, a hard map that is that is kind of difficult to win, but still, I mean, it, it's gonna it's, it could still be either or. Yeah, and Bazaar is a good map for N NIP to go to. They have shown that they can perform here when the pressure's on. Want to see if this is more standard draft with Strix bad? I think it might be. I, can, I don't first. like banning p the power tanks first on second pick. I think you you take out your flex pick and go from there. But it does make sense. We know that NIP will just leave it open, and if N Renegades don't want to deal with it, you just get rid of both. I expect a Makoa ban to shortly follow that, unless they have a specific strat against the Makoa coming in from NIP, but... My guess is that they, they don't, <laughs> just judging right. by how that last game went, uh, where they were playing against yep. it, and it is taken out of the picture. And I would expect a Khan or an Ash quick response from NIP. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there we go. Khan is what they are going to respond with, leaving, you know, the Ash open or the Ruckus potentially for RNG to try and tank, take for their off tank, excuse me. And Barrett is going to be the actual first pick potentially for RNG. Depends on what comes after that is the problem. Yeah, and we'll have to see what it is. I think a DPS could be a good option unless they want to just take both their tanks here. Uh, they could just go Barrack Ash, but they don't really need to unless they think that the Con Ash is really that much of a threat. If it may, they might have to do it if they if they don't want to be stuck with double point tank again because of that. And they are going to be kind of forced we to pick them up. Ash gonna, potentially has potentially get bullied by Khan, but at the very least, it's not into a Makoa again this time I as well. Get us out of here alive. Have to see Stay if it ends up paying off for them. This is a great map for Ash, so it's a lot of pressure on Samoon Chopper, I think. Yeah, it's going to be it's going to allow him him to perform very very well. I mean, you have the opportunities to be able. I mean, you can still get some good overpowers like you said that Khan can counter Ash and I believe that's very very well known at this point to be able to pretty much have this back and forth between the but really between the two of them. And that's going to be really really important especially trying to deny Ash these sort of very small choke points because you know they have a lot of lines of sight that can be broken, mm -hmm. a lot of small rooms on this map. So Ash with a certain dominance or just the ability to be able to control this space is so so important. So Con the first pick Con very very well done by NIP and that's what's really really interesting about this. Eevee though is what they are actually going to hover. I don't know if I like that. Okay, explain. I don't know if I like it this early because I feel like Renegades just take Leon and how right. does how does Eevee have cover? Right. What what are Eevee's options? Honestly, I feel like Eevee can play on the low ground, maybe behind the walls, but that's about it. And taking Cassie opens it up even more for that Leon. So Renegades, both are, with both the DPS picks from NIP potentially in the open already. That wasn't very nice. We'll see what Renegades want to flex to here. I'm assuming Leon and a support are, are what I would guess here. Grab your Genos, take it away from the Eevee Cassie. Mave instead, interesting, but I guess NIP already have two DPSs. You can kind of grab whatever and then flex the last if you think the Leon won't be worth it. They still are leaving an option Welcome open, and Maeve is definitely pretty key on this map to be able to jump over the gates and harass the back line more or less whenever. Yeah, that's going to be really, really important. I mean, Maeve, once again, a lot of these characters, well, at least characters with vertical, a lot of vertical mobility can't get up and over those gates, dive, and then get right back out. Because depending on what side you're on, those gates only open for the ally team associated with those sides. So having that mobility is going to be really, really strong. You've got the Genos as well. I mean, you have a lot of choke points, like we've been mentioning before, so that three time and space is going to be very, very threatening, especially on a lot of these pushes. But NIP, of course, they still have plenty of time to be able to round out their draft. The Anar is still open. They still have the possibility to be able to round it off with something good. Surprise that Ruckus Io Ruckus might, I, might yeah, I was about be to the end that. of this. It is. It makes sense. Uh, this map has a the point on this map is pretty big with some open sight lines. So having Io to just contest from the edges of the point, first. having Ruckus to just be very aggressive, be pocketed by that Io, go, it's going to make it a lot harder for Viral to survive. That Genos yeah. is going to kind of struggle in the back line to withstand that damage. Leon maybe now looking a little bit less good. The right. Ruckus is going to do a lot of bullying 
to stop that Leon from being able to free fire in the back. Maybe a Victor could be a better call. A little bit more sustainy, a little bit more raw damage output might be enough to burst through the Goddess's Blessing on that Ruckus. So what do you, do you like the Willow here? Oh, I, I do. I, honestly, it didn't even occur to me the Willow was still open. Yes, yes, she's definitely open. So used to her being banned that I was just like, oh God, well, she's all the way down here. Leon, Willow, all could be decent options. Willow, they don't really have a great way to deal with the Fae Flight right now. Ruckus and Khan are going to try to hit scan her down potentially, but it's not fantastic. I can tell why they're torn between the two. I think both have their merits. Willow for the tanks, Leon for the DPSs. Depends on what they can play against. I think, honestly, Willow might be the better pick because then you just have your Maeve matching up against the DPSs. Right. You have your Maeve to deal with the DPSs, you have your Willow to deal with the tanks, then you have a decent spread around them. We'll see Neil. That is what they want to do. And it is Leon, so a lot more focus on the DPSs, but maybe maybe they're gonna pull out like a street justice or something. I highly doubt maybe. it. This map is yeah. so this map is so open that you're you're gonna be running Cap Burglar so you can trade damage back with that cast with that EV at mid-range. Definitely helps you in that flank 1v1. Flank 1v1 won't be happening as much. The map has not really not really a lot of flank angles you're gonna be fighting them right. at, but a lot of open area. I gotta say, I think the Leon makes me side a little bit more towards Renegades, but that Io is gonna be so impactful. And Renegades struggled so much with Io in these last couple of days. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like these drafts are still about even though? I mean, they've got a double off take on NIP side, but RG have that point presence. Luna, I mean, more than makes up for yeah. that, though. If Renegades learned how to play against Io in the last day, mm. I think it's even. Okay. If they haven't, then I have to side with NIP. NIP. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. All right, once again, one to one, guys. NIP versus RNG. Who will break the tie in game three? A bit of a return to normalcy maybe here if you're NIP, and, and that, I mean, they don't pick Dredge uh, one more time. Gore, was that, was that too fun maybe on, uh, on Ice Mines? I think, again, I think it came with its merits, but I think it was a little bit in that, that realm of, okay, hear me out, right? Like, that's right. definitely <laughs> one of those hear me out picks, not a, yes, let's do it, Dredge is the hands down best option for us. If you're putting your money on somebody in that NIP booth who said, hear me out about Dredge, who do you think? Bees. <laughs> right, Bees is up there. Out. He's like, all right, I need all of you to listen. Three, two, what about Dredge? What about Dredge? And is it so Bees or it could have been Alex? I don't know. I feel like I always just intuitively, because he is pretty quiet, see Alex is just naturally quiet and would assume yeah. to glance over him, but that seems like something I could see him doing. If nothing else, I think it, it did what they needed him to do, and that was thrown out on the push. But that was the last game. This is this game. They grabbed themselves an IO, and again, as Kresnik pointed out, that's something the Renegades have had a, a tough time dealing with in this qualifying week, figuring out how to play against this IO. And already on the back foot, that's the last thing you want, kind of this double hyper aggression once that Fox is back on the point. And I don't have the exact numbers on me right now, but. Compared to Genos and Maldamba, Io, Furia were the ones that were winning most of this qualifying bracket for these teams. It's just easy control. I mean, you can see 96%, yep. and they can have five aggressive bodies against the Renegades here. Even if you lose one, you just fall back and grab the rest of the point. That's a two for two. Both sides getting involved in the kill feed, and Vocal kind of pulled back here. Hero. The last line of contestion standing here, and he's able to sustain just a little bit longer. Three members of NIP looking at him. The commander's grab sent him up a little bit higher, I think, than NIP were expecting. Against all odds, two members of the Renegades were able to sustain as NIP now look to rejoin this fight, dropping an ice storm. It's going to be very hin hinging on well, Bird, who has respawned, come back into this. We'll be able to place Luna and keep things contested, much like right now. And because of the way the map is oriented, it's pretty easy to keep Luna out of trouble as well, but she does finally go down. Keep Renegade sticking up, trying to match that 96%. And Vocal has enlightenment, and Vocal is dangerous on Leon. We'll have to see what he can do. 300 health to his name. Enlightenment buys him some time, but it connects right with the shield. Alex soars above and hits the important shot of this fight through time and space viral. Doesn't find him any value there as Diggy Dog rounds that final corner, and maybe now the Renegades start to get chiseled away. They're going to end at 93% NIP. They rejoin this fight once the shoulder bashing Moon Chopper is dealt with. This is going to be point number one over to the Ninjas. Yeah, that was the last hit they needed. And this is just, again, a good draft from NIP. You trade out what you had last game with maybe a little bit too much fun, and this time you just go, okay, let's go to a map that's all about fighting and then build a draft where all we have to do is fight really hard. I mean, 
the worst case scenario you have is if Bird goes down and you lose Luna's presence on the point, which did happen, caused some trouble for him. That's why he gets so close for Renegades. Otherwise, if, if Bird is one of the last ones to fall, even if you lose your front line, you're still capturing it. You're still in a good position. Yep. And, well, you're still going to be able to capture anything and everything. You can see the the large percentage lead that Luna at least bought NIP gave them some time to fight back into it once they lost the initial engagement. This is the difficult part, Gore, the, the push here on Bizarre. I mean, the, the point fight tends to go very far back and forth, but these long sight lines are always tough to break down. Unless you find an opening kill onto Invocal. A lot of that long range damage now missing. Ice Storm from Alex used to confirm maybe just a little bit. Hero uses the Dome Shield, but he's so low that it doesn't really buy him any time at all. Shadow's able to trade out one, but Payload's still moving. Moonchopper trying to do anything he can, but you can see how far he's zoned out right now. Can't really get aggressive on the Ash the way you need it to. And the Payload, it's almost just getting walked right in. Someone's going to have to touch. They finally stop it, at least for a little bit on Renegades. Everyone on NIP is still surrounding with Bonker going down. That might be enough to pause this push. Yeah, pause. A minute left for 10 feet. Pause is the, the correct word to use there. Not stop, not end, but definitely a pause. As NIP have plenty of time and not a lot of space to make up. You do have to be careful. This is a map where now with the payload being that close, I don't see a world really where it happens, but you extend too far up this street, Alex can use some of that over and under mobility to kind of get back onto the payload, but Renegades are all bunched up at the back here, so no back door to be had. 24 seconds remaining. Probably one last fight, depending on how long it takes to engage. Hero already into the rocket boots, gets the failsafe reset, but now he has no more mobility. Shadow dashes in, dashes out. Three kills for this mage. Sometimes that's all you need is a big play. And Shadow, he tends to find him at the right time. And looking like he might be able to find one more. Depends on where this Eevee goes, Alex. I think trying to make that cheeky call of can I go get overtime, what can I do with this? Since, well, my life seems forfeit at this point. Where do I go? And well, he tried to get aggressive. I think what we're seeing and what I like to see, and this was a conversation I even saw on Twitter between the games, is just Shadow showing up the way he needs to and Vocal showing up the way he needs to. When it comes down to it, they're two of the best, if not the best two DPS in the league. I mean, they play so ridiculously well, individually and together, that sometimes it doesn't make sense when you look at their slash lines. That's one of the conversations we've had for forever, is just how, you know, in vocal, how do you go 21 and 8 and you know, Three, lose the game? Two, how does Shadow one. get a triple kill right there at a crucial moment? and then not have somebody else on his team kind of step up to match that performance. But it's always him and Invocal. We'll have to see if they can keep that up. They're the ones, if you control them, you control Renegades. Well, that Maeve right now is unhinged, does not have a leash on, and is doing whatever she pleases. They've not been able to control either. You hear a Hexafire kind of ringing out in the distance, and that's Bonker. Moonchopper, I think, counters that one out with an Assert Dominance. Shadow finished the last round with the triple kill. He's going to look for some momentum to start this one off, but the Midnight is indeed countered out by the scout from Cassie. The presence he is bringing. So much pressure down there on the low ground. you got to look around, make sure you're identifying where that threat is coming from. Lots of poke back and forth. Enlightenment flies on through, and Vocal, though, only finds death on the other end as Bonker cleans that one up. The best thing about it, even though you're damage immune during, you're locked in one spot. They know exactly where to aim, and they know exactly the timer for it. Shots were flying towards Invocal before he knew what was coming towards them. And again, even though you get 72%, this is looking like it could be a really good yep. zone. This yeah. is a big Luna moment. Yeah, pop Luna down, get aggressive, keep Bird slightly behind everybody else, which is a good spot for him. Damage reduction on heals, keeps the tanks alive, healthy, and right in the front line. You need Shadow and Invocal to do something insane to break through this kind of barrier. When Hero moves in, it's going to drop the Dome Shield on top of Luna. That's an interesting You call. can see it being targeted and maybe just burning away a little bit. They do get rid of the Fox as Moon Chopper is able to identify a target, and that's, that's Bittner. Hero moves on through. Both of the frontliners for the Renegades getting it done right now, and they're at 96%. A triple kill for the Barrack on the back of the triple kill for Shadow. And Renegades are going to win themselves this mid. I called out two names, and I glanced over the one that was the most important. The Dome Shield Barrack comes through. 
And whether or not he cares about sitting on Io really doesn't matter. He came in, dropped it in the corner where he knew he would be safe. And once that little deployable fox is gone, <laughs> it's just so much more difficult to get anything done. And I love this. They've been We were talking about it on the desk. They mentioned it. They've been having trouble on the Renegades dealing with Io. Hero has just decided going into Bulldozer. I've got Bulldozer too. Luna isn't a huge threat to him. If he can just get to the objective with that, he's guaranteed point control. And he's the only one who can really hold on to it. The next best is Moon Chopper. No one on NIP really screams, yes, this is your point. Yeah, they've seemingly adjusted their play style around this IO. At least for now, is paying off. And IP are able to hold firm on this defense, which is you know, really what you expect on this map. But Renegades were able to stall them out just a couple feet away at the end of the last round. So now mid fights are even. Second defense, the first for NIP to try to defend up in the air. A few ultimates on the table. NIP may have to spend. So you don't, re you really don't want the Renegades going up three to one here at this point, especially after the way that last mid fight went. Not at all. You have to be very careful how aggressive they get. I mean, even with how the last map went, you don't want Renegades being in control here. Here in IP, that's kind of the tilt zone is what I would call it if Renegades go up 2-1. Might not be enough. Again, Renegades, the only issue I have with them as a full team will be, I think, that they do not have a complex map pool. About four that come to their name. But Moonchopper right now oh doing my. what he needs. That's three for the Ash. Everyone wants a triple on this team. Whether it's the Mave or the Barrack or the Ash, everyone's getting involved and suddenly... This payload is going to get very close by the time NIP are able to respawn in vocal positioning himself, himself outside of that gate. Nobody to open it for him. That will only open for NIP if they get close enough. So the payload is going to stop right there for now. Inch backwards when nobody's on it. Renegades could spend some ults here to make it 3-1. to one. NIP might look to do the same to try to tie up this game. The dive is up and back from Shadow. Bonker drops down, pouring in damage to, into the Mave, who has to back off now. Fox contesting the payload, but Dome Shield used one more time on top of the Fox. Hero felt fine doing it in the mid fight. Seems fine to be doing it right now. Bonker getting burnt down. One last shot. Diggy Dog's able to find the kill, and Bittner does the same. And suddenly, Hero's a little bit more caught out. That's two kills from the Cassie. Bittner may just save his team on this defensive side. Alex is here to save the day as well. And the stun, actually, from wow. Luna prevents him from getting back. And NIP tie it up. That's just well played from both sides. And honestly, a huge win, I would argue, for NIP, getting rid of the Dome Shield where they do. It's a heavy investment. And you have to be willing, willing, willing to well, take the loss that comes with it. They threw it out there. They tried whatever they could. Moon Chopper is in a good zone right now. And they maintain a majority of their ults. The ones that matter outside of Dome Shield are still up in Midnight and assert dominance. So you keep yourself alive, Five, but you do it at the cost of the three, fact that two, NIP have full four. zone control. They have everything they need, and that is more than enough to be able to try and take this. 2-2, two, two, all it takes is one point capture right now, and you can win the game. No dome shield. That that was you know something you mentioned, but that's a big tool in at least the last two fights on how Hero has been able to deal with that fox. Not gonna have it here. Through time and space locks up one, or assert dominance locks up one. Viral grabs the other with the through time and space. It's a two for two so far. Diggy Dog pulls in uh, Moon Chopper, but he just turns right back around and rejoins the fight. Maybe he just tries to get rid of him for a moment, but doesn't really buy him much of anything. And now it's Bird who's fluttering away, and the Renegades they're able to win one more mid. And doing everything they need. I mean, Moonshopper walked by while we were outside the booth. Just said three more. That's all they need, technically, to go forward. He's not wrong. And it's coming through with these point fights. I mean, the way they're playing right now, specifically the way Moonshopper's playing right now, is enough to pivot the way Renegades should be seen. He is a threat, which is something that most of the time you can ignore. Finally, they get rid of him. And that, I think, is going to make it a lot easier for NIP to try and get in here. But it's a one-for-one -one trade. Yeah, Diggy Dog's found himself a couple good targets around this corner. Vocal up on the high ground. They're going to have to deal with him. But it's not to be right here. He might even win the triple kill against Bird right around the corner. One last shot. This is a big one versus one. Alex comes to save the day. And Vocal nearly had it done. 
Alex goes down nonetheless into the Hexafire. Goes Bonker, just going to zone the Renegades out around the corner. One more Dome Shield from Hero immediately killed off. Does not reset your health pool or anything like that. A double kill from the Ruckus maybe keeps NIP in it. Viral does whatever he can to get rid of it. Renegades were running away with this. If that Dome Shield were still up instead of being used as like a last minute save my life, it might just be all she wrote. But assert dominance, 70%. The longer the fight goes, the more likely that is to come back. So Renegades might be more than willing to let NIP have 30, 40% if it means getting themselves in a good position to try and take back the point one last time. White and Mint, no good. Bittner instead returns the damage onto Invocal. Kind of flanks around with this backhand wall here, this backside wall. Now just looking for the angle. Viral very low. Through time and space one more time in this fight, but instead it's Shadow who does enough damage as Diggy Dog trades out with one under the healer and Bittner is alive as well. You have just a sustained advantage now if you're NIP and a, a stun onto Shadow thanks to Luna. Could help out in dividends. Hero right back to the point though. Bonker falls at the hands of this barrack. Hero just dancing around. Not enough, not in time, but Renegades, they still have a chance. And yeah, it's only 78% where all this overtime keeps ticking down. Overpower is going to be available as well as the Ice Storm a lot to try and lock down yeah, the Mage or the Leon, but you gotta do something with it. Alex goes down. That's one of the ults offline for an IP. And they have an assert dominance that could seal up this mid fight. You might not even need it as Bonker falls as well. And now it's two members of NIP. This fight for the Renegades is starting to run away. Now with Bird going down, it definitely is. Renegades one point away from taking a lead in this quarterfinal. And pretty much exactly what you'd want to see out of them, right? When you have that back against the door feel for them, I'm just like, wait a minute. We don't have to hold on like it's not 99 to 99 let them have it for yeah. a second they have 20 percent, and that's that call that navi would make that nip would make like the top teams have to recognize these moments renegades have usually struggled with that historically they get nice. all aggressive all the time now they're getting all aggressive but in all the right moments moon chopper with two kills there is beautiful moon chopper is playing like something else today that was an aggressive assert dominance and a couple of kills to cap it off that is not confidence that you always see out of him. But he's playing with it today, and it's helping his team get some progress on this payload. Maybe one final chance for NIP to defend. They've been fighting all week to get a spot here today in the quarterfinals. Now they're fighting tooth and nail to get past NIP. They know what the odds are on this, but this is the same team they came through in phase two and still beat Na'Vi. This That's is the right. team that just beat the Knights a couple days ago. They're not a team you can count out despite a 4-24 and record in the regular season. They are doing everything in their power to make sure that that gets forgotten. If they win this, this is actually would be their fourth set this week yeah. that they would come through with a win on. It's been a turnaround. Whatever they did this last week to prep, if nothing else has kept them competitive in what were traditionally lopsided sets this year. Now just needing to put a couple more map wins together. The through time and space is not going to connect this time from Viral. And Vocal very low, has to slide off to the side. Tense moments here for NIP as they try to defend for what would be a tying point and trying to avoid going down to the Renegades in this set. Obviously everyone very confident coming into it. Enlightenment does hit for some damage, but Invocal locked in place. And that's two kills, now three for NIP. I think they... Hey, miscalculated. There's all, I don't think there's another way to word it where Renegades, they used the Midnight thinking it would provide more, and more than anything, it pulled out Miscal. That's all it did. But then kills started rolling true and through here for NIP. Made it a lot easier for them to kind of barrel it down. They don't have Dome Shield. They don't have a certain dominance, but it's at 81%. It'd take a lot of overtime to get that back, but that might be where their mind is at. But with Hero getting shredded like that, it's not looking good. Yeah, things looking dire suddenly on this push. Bonker dives in, Moon right. Chopper. Not enough sustain. You can see that health bar slowly whittling down. The shoulder bash buys him some time, but that's just about all he's gonna get. We're tied up at three. And suddenly the ultimates look a little bit more discrepant. Almost was able to get it. I don't know if he would have wanted to use it there. I don't think it would have been a good call. I don't. The rest of the fight wasn't going well enough to say, yes, Moon Chopper, drop the ult. But it definitely might take some wind out of their sails. The longer the game goes, the more likely it is they slow down a little bit. And they don't have anything like the, the Midnight coming into this round. I didn't see what charge it was. That. We'll see that when we get back into the game after the replays. But that's a huge factor 
in this fight for the Renegades, as well as when they get rid of that scout. It's going to come up a little more often than Midnight, so it's guaranteed there as a counter, unless you can pull it out. CC immunity is very tantalizing if you're a Cassie. It's six seconds of it. If you can try to force her to use it early just to avoid a stun, you might be able to get Shadow in a good position. This is a big mid fight. Dictates a lot of pacing in the remainder of this set, this quarterfinal. Both teams playing it slow to start off. Overpower. Does it connect? Yes, it does, but one more time. They're not able to finish off the kill. Assert Dominance comes into peel. Bittner rejoining the fight with two kills of his own. That Cassie has been pivotal in a lot of these fights. Looking for a little bit more as Moon Chopper gets Commander's grabbed over the top of Diggy Dog here in this case. And now the Renegades getting burnt through NIP. Somehow sustain through that overpower. And are able to stay in this fight. Just doing whatever they can. Viral pushed incredibly far back. Luckily, has a little bit of range on his heels and a through time and space, can look for a snipe. There's been a couple of moments where maybe it would be key, but of course he's not seen it. That one's going to go through, but it's not going to connect on the bit. It was very close, and Vocal does get the kill onto Bonker. That's a big kill for them, double kill for the Leon. As he rounds the corner, a 1v1 with Bittner goes the way of the Cassie, and now it's a double kill for the NIP backline. Make it three, dodge roll forward. Renegades are getting crumbled. NIP, they're going to run away with this game as Renegades Still have a chance with Hero, I guess. You could drop down the Dome Shield, sustain just a little bit longer. They don't want to dive in there. May have called it too soon. Hexafire flies on through. Hero's able to rocket boots his way out. Now the Renegades are back in on the fight. Doing anything and everything they can to try to touch down, but they just don't have the bodies to compete with this. They managed to get a touch. Moon Chopper's still in there. That might just be all they have are the bodies. Oh, a dodge from Bonker off to the right-hand side. Moon Chopper's still going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Fox on the point right now. Somehow the Renegades have rejoined this fight, and they have numbers right now. It's all four versus four. Moon Chopper right around the other side of this pillar. Shoulder bash into the Fox. Diggy Dog gets the kill onto Hero. If they identify Moon Chopper, things look bad for the Renegades, but Invocal sliding off to the side, looking to get cleaned up here. NIP, they out sustain and they stay alive, but tense moments there at the end. Midnight just coming available there for Shadow towards the end, and a lot of that just shows how valuable Luna is, and why the target that they actually got Hero yep. was more important. Moon Chopper did not have Bulldozer. Of the members of Renegades that did, yep. Hero was the one that had the highest tier, could have dealt with that the best, but they focused him down a lot sooner. Yep. No Sir Dominance to keep himself alive. They had the bodies, but the momentum was just still there for, for NIP. Yep. Even if they were able to win that fight, it was 99 to 24. They're going to need a long time <laughs> to climb up that mountain. That's true. I mean, it, it was kind of a difference. You know, it's an even fight, maybe 4v4, but it was everyone rejoining from the Renegades. Yeah. It wasn't one consistent push. So there was maybe some some tense moments there for NIP, but they're able to hold true, break this tie. They go up 2-1 in this set with Game 4 right after this. Welcome back, guys. A very, very intense intense match on Bazaar is going to leave NIP the victors of this game right here. But however, the thing is, Renegades, they were close. I mean, it was 3-3. Three, yeah. three. They were utilizing their ults well. Their cooldowns were great. But they cannot let this kill their momentum. They have to keep fighting. Yeah, I think just the small missteps in the end, Moonchopper using the Assert Dominance to try to save Hero when the fight was already 
kind of lost. Yeah. One or two, one v ones, maybe not going the right way. We saw Bird very, very low on HP. Almost just got soloed by Invocal at half HP, but Invocal just a little bit too tentative on that dash cooldown. That Grace could have killed Bird, but he held off until Alex came to save the day. So close, but at the end of the day, NIP clutched it out when it mattered. Yeah, and that's what matters most of all. Is once again, they were the ones that ended up breaking this tie. Now they're up two one against the Renegades. It's going to be a pretty big deal from this point forward. Has the Renegades' momentum been killed, or can they still be able to fight back? That's literally what matters. I don't. I think the the biggest thing here is that Renegades haven't lost on a map that they've chosen yet. That's true. Right? They could just say, "Well, we put it we put it really close on Bazaar." Yeah, Frog maybe not so close, but still, it's it's all maps that NIP have picked that Renegades have lost on. Now, from this point moving forward onto maps that Renegades wants, maybe if NIP maybe take one and swing it four out, then I could see momentum being totally killed. But until then. I don't see it as that that much of a of a dig at their at their confidence. We've seen them go down two four O's immediately in a row to and to Navi mm. in the past, and then strike back and take that whole set. Gonna have to see exactly how it goes. But I gotta say, on NIP, the most impressive player for me was the way that Tenor played that Cassie. Mm. I think being able to withstand the pressure that was coming in. I think Bonger did a great job too at being able to stay alive, but this was actually the key moment that I think kind of yeah. gave things up. That assert dominance stunned Bird, but Tenor just cleaned up on everybody who tried to follow up. Yeah, I mean, once again, they had so much pressure just up there. The Renegades, so many intense point fights back to back to back. And this is the thing. You put Tenor on this Cassie. He's done so well on these backline DPSs. Really, really good as a backline DPS. And that's the thing, is that you have to be able to be careful when you're around this man. He's going to be able to have pop-off games, very, very exceptional, just like this, to be able to close it out for his team and allow them to catch the victory. Yeah, him being so clutch, I think, matters a lot for this team. They've made it to the finals of a land before. They made it to MSI finals before mm -hmm. they dropped to Penta. But in the past, back at Worlds, they could not get past. They couldn't get past the quarters. Mm. That's just in the way. This is a good opportunity for them to do that. But they're going to have to keep this momentum that they managed to have from the last map. I, I do. I want to tell this that as we were walking to the desk, we we bumped into B is on the way, and he went, "Not even close." <laughs> as you're about to turn the corner, so that's maybe a confidence they're going to need moving into the next map. Yeah, hopefully they can keep that for sure. Stone Keep though is where we're going to be going. This is indeed the Renegades map pick. So this is where they want to go. This is their choice. So they're going to be the ones that are hope or can hopefully. Make sure they can catch out a win. Yeah, so this is what's going to be the most important thing for their momentum. If they lose this map that they want, then I think it's going to be very hard to recover, especially against a team that plays as dominantly as NIP does. They like to make things. They like to end the games fast and on their terms. NIP. Well, Renegades start with a Strix ban. Don't want to play against Tenor Strix, and I wouldn't either. Yeah, I agree. Strix is something that NIP pulled out a long time ago before Strix was being played by everybody and made it work. So I wouldn't be shocked to see them be... Very proficient at that pick. And NIP thinking pretty hard about their response. Yeah. I mean, they've got to plan very, very accordingly around RNG. Once again, the last game was pretty close. Yeah, I see a few smiles here and then the Renegade side. The momentum may not have been killed, but they will get rid of the get rid of the Willow on this map, which makes sense. Willow, strong character overall. And, I mean, that's going to be really, really important for sure. With Makoa banned, I think NMP want to respond with an Atlas unless they think they have the answer to it. But Atlas is one of the harder power tanks to counter. Atlas going to be banned as well. And Khan, early picked for Renegades. And I think that's a pretty decent choice for them. Not a not a bad look to give Moonchopper Khan something that he's been doing decently well at so far in this land. Yeah, I mean, Khan is going to be first picked on RNG's side, just as you were mentioning, my friend. And that's more than likely going to be going to Moonchopper. And that's already looking good for the Renegades. I mean, they've got what they wanted. That means that if they try and pick that Ash, if they try and manipulate it towards them, Khan will be there to stop that. I mean, we saw the presence it had against the Ash last game on the Bazaar. So Khan, definitely a very, very good first pick here. NIP, though, are going to be hovering that barrack, and they're thinking about who they want to go second. Yeah, especially good because it might make them not want to lock in the Ash that quickly. Khan so good against the Ash, but it might just, they just want to grab both. Deny the potential for Renegades to go double off tank IO. We haven't really seen a lot of IO from RNG. We've seen it mostly from other teams. If Renegades want to take it from them, they're going to have to show that they're proficient on it. But we've seen these teams that aren't practicing IO, they're not, that's not, not the best when they pull it out. I mean, look back at, at Navi earlier today. They yeah. tried to pull out IO, Navi did, and they, without time on it, again, we said it, it's not a pick up and play champion. Such a unique style. Gameplay coming out from IO. A lot you have to maintain a lot of time you have to put into that champion to make it work. Yeah. And 
Once again, they have to really consider, hey, who do we want in this scenario? I mean, the Cassie is a possibility. I mean, they, they have their options for sure. I mean, it's sort of hard to know with just the bearing, just with the Ash. But at the same time, once again, Cassie, I can see that being picked here. But it's, you know, they're hovering the Maeve and the Genos. That's what they want to lock in. Take that away from NIP. They still haven't picked their damage. They still haven't picked their support. So they want that Luminary buff for sure. Seems like a very standard draft for Renegades. Cool. Yeah, very. I mean, I, I, right now I can already predict they're probably going to end with an Inara and they're going to end with a Leon or a Cassie, whatever's right. left from NIP. Most likely Leon. I feel like Cassie is going to be okay. a very soon pick for NIP because they know that Renegades want that Inara to get that point contest. Having the big game from the Cassie will be very impactful at burning them down. The percentage health damage very effective against basically everybody. Even if you hit the disengage on the Maeve, it really can it can help you win those duels. Help you burn through that damage reduction that Maeve gets on basically all of her abilities with be the right build. Humble, yeah, Furia is who Bird is going to be sitting on. That's a very, very powerful character. Eevee is who actually they're going to lock them into the Cassie that they might try and take that, but it seems like they're leaving it pretty open. They've got the fury, they've got the support, they've got their flank, which leaves them a little bit more flexible towards the end. And the BK, how do you feel about that? I think it's a good pick for Renegades. I really like it on this map. Not su not too surprised to see them go that way. It means we're going to see in vocals Maeve and Renegades, and, and sorry, Inara, like I said, common for Renegades to pair with the Genos. Definitely don't expect anything else to be going in that slot. Bomb King going to be very good at pushing up top fighting back against any backline that NIP have. Look at this comp. I wouldn't be too shocked to see NIP try to end with a victor once these two picks get locked in from Renegades. I know they like that victor. Don't worry, very subjects. good for Tenor. After a lot a of just lashes, very strong damage potential coming in from him. And I'm glad that the Renegades are laughing. You are keeping not themselves welcome in high here. hopes. That's, that's the kind of mentality that they, they've had in the games that they've won. They're going to need to keep that up to keep this moving forward. I mean, once again, it was pretty close fighting up against NIP on Bazaar. Hopefully they can keep it close and take a win to try and even things up. But once again, NIP are going to be the ones that are last picking, finding out how they want to run out of their draft. I can see the Cassie. I mean, more I, that, I, that's screaming to me right now. But I was also about to bring up the Victor. Having that backline spam is going to be pretty good, too. I got to say, calling a pick like three in advance is really the it's really the best yeah, feeling. It is. I, I really feel like I just kicked a, a, a field goal and Not the powers it just went through. Victor is locked in for NIP. Going to be good when he's inflamed. The raw damage going to do a lot at keeping that Inara off of the objective. And that's an advantage that NIP are going to want to hold on to. Bonker in the past has kind of struggled on some of the point tanks when they don't play that double off tank. So having Victor to kind of equalize it puts this a little bit in NIP's favor. Yeah, but we'll have to see if they can end up making this win against the Renegades. Or can the Renegades tie it up? We'll toss it down to your caster so we can just jump into it. Yeah, this one's important. NIP can widen that gap. Renegades can tie it up. It's my favorite scoreline for a reason. I think Renegades going back to that Bomb King, it worked for them so much throughout this qualifier week. I like that pivot. And being able to come through, Shadow looked phenomenal, oh, yeah. like you said. If we get that level of play, this game's over. But the problem is, Renegades, specifically on Stone Keep, Super inconsistent. It's one of the few things about it is that this is a map that they love going to that they don't, you know, really seal the deal on that often. Yeah. When they do, it's not exactly the cleanest game for them. That was something, you know, while we were working with Bees this week, I was able to talk to him about it. And that's just one of the things about Renegades. This is one of the maps they love and have done well on and can do well on. And this is a great draft for them on it. A lot of factors in their favor. Yeah. The problem is they're up against NIP, and that just Three, might two, put a dent in this. That really is where it falls apart. So it does kind of depend, I think, on the shadow more than anything that we see in this game. It's a consistency. That's what the Renegades have lacked throughout this season. We've seen days where they look like the best team in this league, and then days where they look like the eighth seed. Which Renegades do we get? Well, right now in vocals, making a more like the former. 12% for them on the point. Opening couple of kills, both for the Renegades. Look at that space control. The long range shots from Shadow. Opens things up very well here for the blue side. Really good connections on some of those bombs. I mean, it is difficult to convey how it feels to throw a Bomb King bomb, but it is very difficult to, to find these long range shots and connect with that amount of accuracy and damage. So very good on him to be able to kind of keep Bonker on his toes and keep him low down. Even right here, right over wow. the shield, it's perfect for him. His positioning, you know, it's not that he's doing anything flashy. Nobody from NIP has been able to move up and aggress towards him. He just teed off from the high ground. Gets it done on the low ground as well. 
And that's about as clean of a mid fight as you could hope for if you're the Renegades. Halo's starting to move with RNG in the lead. Not a single kill on the side of NIT. They no. weren't able to do anything from Alex getting first blooded. For the last couple of kills that have rolled through, everything has been going their way. And Vocal with a really good early flank, just kind of causing a distraction factor. No one has looked at this bomb game because of that. So right now, he has been pretty much uncontested. You can see the thought. He poppy bombs to the high ground, thinks he might be able to buy a little bit of space. And then enough of a collapse from NIP to put that one to bed. This is, this is really what NIP need. I mean, you get blown out of the water in the first minute or so of this game. You need to just get something going in your favor. Losing Diggy Dog is not that. An overpower as well. Moonchopper could keep this thing moving. If he should choose to select a target. Hero bit caught out here. A bit disjointed of a fight from the Renegades. Bonker adds two. Couple of good shots here. Bonker is in that awkward area where you try to get aggressive for nope. your defense and then you just get isolated from your team instead. You don't actually get to do as much as you want. He gets a kill here, which is more than enough to justify his positioning. But those are those, like, right on the edge of a line. If one kill goes the way of Renegades there, you are in stagger territory, and that becomes a dangerous game to be playing. And they had the backup they needed, all their ults available. Your best case scenario if you're in IP right now, keep the defense, burn some of their ults. Yeah. Specifically, an overpower would be good to get out, and I think a king bomb. If you get rid of those two, you can typically deal with the midnight. Resilience will yep. come online. That will also help you against the seismic crash going to the next round. I'm interested to watch the balance uh, between Moon Chopper and Diggy Dog. You know, so often we see that overpower saved for the assert dominance and, and really doesn't get used until the assert dominance is used. Every once in a while, maybe it's used for a pick. Here, though, neither team electing to use any of their ultimates. That's a good dismount. He's going to have to take the long way around. But that's kind of where I look with the overpower, with the assert dominance. Does he save it just for that assert dominance every single time? That remains to be seen. As of right now, it doesn't seem to be coming out. If they can keep him locked down or do any damage to him, Diggy just keeps his health bar full there. Ooh, nice. And that's going to be clean kills for an IP. That was an important turnaround from Bird as well, and Vocal was kind of wreaking havoc in the back line. Now it's just Hero. All by his lonesome, out on an island. He's going to keep overtime going. How much time can he buy, though? Not enough. Overtime doesn't look like it will be reset. Actually, a nice little read there at the end from Diggy. Knows where. And Vocal will be diving from. But now revert back to that mid-fight if you're the Renegades, and you got point number two easily. It's going to be an interesting turnaround. This is what I want to see. Someone get up there. Or don't. I don't care. Either way, I either get good Bomb King play, or I see good adaptation from NIP. No matter what, it's going to be a fun caveat, I guess, yep. or change into this round. Dynamic. Dynamic for the game. Shadow started, I think he was 3-0, and then 3-1. and one. Yep. Now he's 5-4. and four. So mid-fight, way <laughs> stronger and way faster and high octane for him than the rest of the round. Whereas Alex starts off being first blood and has turned it around on the 9th yep. Street now. At least in the early parts of this game, the makings of a blaster duel. Through time and space, used through time and space, connects. Bittner catches that one on the chin. Shadow poppy pumps aggressively over the top of Diggy Dog. Dome shield used by NIP, by Bonker, just to stay alive. Unfortunately, it doesn't do its job. He gets a double kill, his Shadow. One more time, the Renegade's in control of this mid. King bombs up, and that is sometimes more than enough to stop any sort of pushback from NIP. They've got the ultimate economy, though, in their favor. It just depends on how effective they can be with it. With no Dome Shield available, Overtime starts to disappear. Well, here's going to be the King Bomb looking for Valker. It's looking, doesn't detonate it, actually. Rolls back around. Now the Assert Dominance, he's able to Poppy Bomb away from that one. Diggy Dog controlling space, but doesn't really stun up anybody. He needs to move out and get onto the point, but he's not able to do so. In the meantime, Shadow grabs another kill. Two for the Bomb King. Be careful when this guy starts to feel himself because your game becomes much harder. And the Renegades... They forged that into another mid-fight win. And I love the way they played that. There was one key moment. Assert Dominance comes out. And as you were mentioning, a lot of what we see, overpower, pull out the Ash, then kill her while Assert Dominance is available. 
Renegades just said, no, nah, we don't need to. Ignore her and left Diggy Dog in the bottom of the keep where he couldn't affect anything if he wanted to be able to kind of utilize his ult. Instead, go over, use it on Bonker, get rid of the presence on the point, and put Moonchopper in a good position to charge it back up at 40% already. So good calls coming from them, good positioning, and just making sure things work for them and, and kind of line up. Man. Shadow could even go down here, and it doesn't matter because he got two kills. Shadow is such a, a blast to watch. Pun intended, thank you very much. 11-5 and 4 on this Bomb King. You can really tell once once he gets that momentum, the 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 kind of rhythm on this champion. It, it's a whole different look at the Renegades. And what are these mid fights? I mean, he was five and four yeah, coming into this <laughs> round. He went six and oh, now no. two. Sorry, Shadow. Where he's come in. That's our fault. But I mean, six and one around the point. Yep. Where it's now one death that gets tacked on here for the defense, and that's not bad for him. I mean, yeah. Die as much as you want. Don't get a push as long as you're going six and one around the mid fights. Yeah. I don't think the rest of Renegades Take em. care. I'm gonna be comfortable and happy with that one. Again, the question I think comes up at the end of the round is what can he do? What are yep. they willing to commit? I'd say go go for anything. Good although good don't get stunned right there. That's a good stun from Perd. Maybe more so bad bad positioning there from Shadow. Chooses to walk right where he shouldn't be in that moment. Still 35 seconds left for the Renegades. Ultimate's getting charged. Consider that overpower ready as well. No inflame for NIP. And this is a kind of game-changing moment here, whether it's a, a push or a defense from NIP. Through time and space. DR'd out yep. by the shoulder bash. 15 seconds left. Overpower is good. That's on to Bittner. They're looking to push this one in, and they're looking to do it now. Moonchopper with the opening kill. Thanks to his ultimate, will Diggy Dog Spend the assert dominance. You may have to. Shoulder bash down. King bomb as well from Shadow. From the back line. Rolls on through. Diggy Dog down. Dome shield off of the point now from Bonker. The poppy bomb backwards just to stay safe. And things slowing down just for a moment. Respawn proximity in favor of NIP though. He can just drop down, but they're all dead. Whoa! All oh, they had to do was get Bonker. Nobody was in range to drop down. And Renegades, they go one point away from tying up this set one more time. Keeping everyone on their toes, even in IP. But it is dangerous to give an IP comeback mechanic. Definitely a game that you might not want to be playing with. We'll have to see how it goes. Beautiful mid-air shot from Viral. All right, there. Gore, I'll bite. What do you do? If you're an IP, how do you win this mid-fight? How do you deal with Shadow? You send Alex after him? The I don't know. They the, haven't been able to. Well, the hard thing is, is it's not just deal with Shadow. Shadow's doing well. And... Don't get me wrong, he's playing out of his mind, but it's not just because he's playing well. Sure. It's in Vocal, who's creating a lot of space for him. That's where it's I think everything. a lot of this presence is coming from, as well as Viral hitting shots like that. Moonchopper having a good game. Yeah. It's these positioning advantages that Renegades are taking over an IP that is changing up the game. But if they use their ults too poorly on yep. the side of Renegades, NIP still have a good fighting chance. And I really liked that angle on board with Invoco. You could see a lot of the NIP eyes turned back towards their back line. Assert Dominance was used to start off this fight from NIP. One for one trade so far. You're missing Shadow if you're Renegades, but you're missing Bonker if you're NIP. Call it even, call it what you will. Invoco grabs another kill onto Diggy Dog. Bittner, nice grenade. Seals up the kill on Viral as well. Things finally starting to slow down. Nobody really on top. Trying to do whatever they can. Try and, try and tie it up. Uh oh. And that kill onto Bittner is going to be good, but I think the kill onto his vocals a little bit better. It opens up some aggression that would potentially allow Alex, should allow yeah. Alex, to get into the back line here and cause some trouble for the Renegades. On the point with 42%. Stunning beam. Soars on through. Shadow doesn't make the same mistake twice. Doesn't step into that one. Great angle on Bonker, and he's able to capitalize on that. Shoulder bash defensively. From Diggy Dog through time and space. The thought was there, the connection was not. 69 up to 72% for the Renegades. One more zone could win you this game, could tie up this set. NIP looking to re engage. Alex has the Ice Storm, might have to use it, doesn't use it just yet. Overtime will be reset. King Bomb looking to roll on through. Only the Ice Storm from NIP. Bonkers the first to go down. Shadow looking for a little bit more damage, not able to find it just yet, but with both of your front lines gone, NIP. 
they're starting to tumble apart. Renegades, they look like they're in control, and they're going to tie up this set. Keeping everything interesting. Again, everybody can win in this day. That's the one thing that they kept saying towards the end of the phase. Any team we ask just depends on who shows up that day. Well, Renegades have been showing up this week, period. Yeah. The question I think that is going to be going through my mind more than anything is not can they do it. I think they absolutely can. They can, so yes. Can they consistently keep this up? They only need two more games. Same thing said for NIP. I also want to know where that confidence for NIP has gone. Is oh, it deflated no. a little bit? Is it still there? I mean, this is a dangerous position to be in, but not unreasonable. The last time they faced yeah. in the regular season, it was a 4-2. So, yeah, you've dropped two maps, but you've never dropped more than this if you're an IP. I don't know. You know, we move into the quarterfinals, and it's one of those, it just takes one game. You know, are the Renegades throughout this split going to consistently beat NIP? The answer to this split was no. But can they beat them on any given day once? The answer should be yes. We're tied up at two. Another tiebreaker, this time game five, right after this break. We've got a match, y'all. We've got a 2 2 tie between NIP versus Renegades, dude. I mean, I don't. This is sick. I, are you going to do that every time Renegades wins a match? <laughs> I think <laughs> you did it last time, dude. The slow. Wow. Yeah. Paladins was just played. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. No, it's, it's a good way to do it because, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely surprising how well mm -hmm. they're performing for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely knew this potential was there for them this whole time, but a lot of things are waking up for them. Some great peel, I think, from Moonshopper mm -hmm. across the board, keeping his team alive. There was a great commander's grab at one point that he hit onto Alex when he was trying to dive onto Hero to save him at the last moment. And Shadow, we, people, some people were asking, oh, why is why is BK getting banned on Ice Mind? Right, yeah. I think That's he just why. got a, a exam. That's exactly a, why. A, a dissertation on why <laughs> that was the case. <laughs> there are literally tons of reasons as to why you banned it. And Stone Cape was the exact reason. Whenever you put Shadow on the BK, dude, I mean, there has never been a time where I've seen Shadow on the BK where he hasn't popped. Like, yeah. this is literally... That is his character. You put him on this character, and he pops off entirely, both literally in explosives and figuratively, because he's just playing that guy. Yeah, the Genos boost on the BK2 is really impactful. 1,035 damage per sticky. It yeah. shreds tanks. It, it shreds DPSs. King Bomb's connecting too was a big deal. Living through the ice storm that hit him here. I think he barely had any HP left. Double digits. He had 70. The Genos mark plus the BK sustain that he always runs in his deck kept him alive, kept him from getting pressured, and he still pressured Alex out in the end there. Yeah. Even at double digits, he still turned it around. And that's the kind of stuff that you're going to need to keep seeing if they want to close out this set. Yeah, they have to keep, they have to hold on to their momentum, try and fight back against NIP. And they are certainly doing it in Kai by making it an even 2-2 two, two score. I mean, once again, we've had some bangers of a game today. First, yeah. the, the first set was amazing. The second set was amazing. And now this one, I mean, I literally, there, there's so much going on before we actually have to get to HRX, man. I'm so excited for Here's it. Here's the thing, though. Mm. Renegades to win this set are going to have to win an NIP map. 
That's true. To, to win this set, they're going to have to flip at least one around. They've gotten close. Bizarre. We're so close. They're going to need to flip it around, though. We've known, because if it keeps going in this order, right, we're 2-2 two, two right now. This is NIP's pick. If NIP win that, then it's Renegades' pick. After that, back to NIP for the final game. If there's any time to do it, it's going to be then. And must be running a little hot in that room because they're trying to use a water bottle to cool themselves <laughs> down, which is a big change because usually those rooms are frigid. Right. That would be amazing if that room is cold. But NIP, calm, collected, potentially ready to flip this set back around on its head. Yeah, once again, just as you were mentioning before, Crescent, my man, this is NIP's map pick. So they will have the advantage here. They will be the – well – Theoretically, they will have the advantage with the map pick. They will be the ones that actually sort of have that control. They'll be able to go to some place familiar or some place it is they actually like to go. And with that, Renegades, they have to be on their toes, man. They have to be ready to fight back against whatever it is that they might try and lock in. Yeah. I want to see w what maps are pretty much remaining for them. Let me go to my little tab that I've written this stuff down. Dun, dun, dun. Let's see, we still have some standards up. I think Bright and Jag are both still in rotation, potentially, so I wouldn't be shocked to see both of those before this set ends, especially since this is NIP's pick. Mm. I think Jag would be pretty much expected for them. That That's something they like to do. It's a map that I think is flexible for them. They're willing to play different things on it, too. Yep. Playable for Zin, which is something they like. They've played Eevee on that map, which normally isn't really super in contention for it, but right. something they were willing to pull out. But they want to go to Timber Mill instead. I wonder how many DPSs they're going to lock on their team this time oh on Timber Mill. Uh, th this is the, the previous site of their quad DPS that they ran against Envy. But I wouldn't expect to see that here. Everything is on the line. If NIP lose two Renegades here, that's it. They're done. Not yep. going to HRX. And Renegades will take that spot in the semifinals from them. And this is how they're going to they're going to have to keep performing with it on the line. But again, last year, NIP did not make it through quarterfinals. And Renegades are looking to make that happen again. Yeah, I mean, they got rid of both snipers both teams immediately okay we got Knesset all right RNG have Strix they don't want to deal with these characters on this map and like we were saying before I wouldn't want to deal with Bittner Strix either but they get rid of the Genos though so that's going to put RNG in kind of a rough spot why is Bird looking like a selectable character from Jet Set Radio <laughs> I don't know I, I, I love that jacket <laughs> but he really looks like I could catch him doing graffiti outside the building after this oh man again Atlas Band again. They're going to give up Makoa, but it is Timber Mill. Remember, we talked about this. How, yeah, that's how true. Makoa that's true, actually. Went, G Bunny went like 10 and 21 on this right. map with Makoa. And then I think, no, it. they're not going to take Makoa. This is what I was saying. It's just not worth it here. Is it worth it for Renegades to take it? They might just want to do some strong backlines that will just yep. deny Makoa that pressure. But I think on second pick, it might still be worth it to take. And I'm glad that you mentioned that earlier. We've seen it on this same map on Timber Mill. When the Pittsburgh Knights were fighting against their earlier opponents, they did luck in McCoy. It was not it was looking really, really rough for G Bunny. Once again, it is left open. But that's a good point that you put up in the air, Kresnik. It's literally, what do they lock in? Do they want both of their DPS to already be picked? Will they try and go for the McCoa, or will they just let it fall flat? They honestly might. It really does struggle on this yeah, map. If taking Leon. it later, I think, is worth it for sure. And Leon hovered for Renegades. Possibly Koa coming in after it. But also Ash could be a decent pick, too. Having that, that ground control ruckus also very solid on this map. Something that is in Moon's hero pool. Mm -hmm. Champion pool definitely has that in it. It's going to be Leon and Maeve. Two yeah. DPSs Neil. taken for now. Maeve, very versatile on this Welcome map. To the a lot of ground that he can cover. Leon, very good at countering flanker. So if Eevee's taken on the other side, that'll definitely be a good deterrent to keep that Eevee off of the high ground, off of their support, depending on what draft they end up with, if they have a support that really can't defend themselves. Yeah. I mean, once again, this is looking pretty good for them. They've locked in both of their damages, but that allows NIP to be a lot more flexible. Once again, Makoa is still open. I don't know if either team is going to go for it here. I mean, we've seen the earlier games. I'm sure both of these teams being very, very seasoned know what the risk of taking Makoa on this map is. So I feel like they might try and let it fall flat. They might try and pick it. I mean, it's still up in the air. But once again, I'm, 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 I'm not envisioning a, a Makoa pick on Tipperville. Here's the thing. If NIP go Makoa, that means Bonkers going to be playing Khan, and that means it's going to be point tank Khan on Timber Mill, right. which is really rough. There's so much verticality, you're just getting shot over your shield all game, and we have a potential of seeing unpicked, unbanned Makoa. Yeah. That's just timber, though. The, right. the, the high grounds are sometimes just too far away. It's very easy to kite away. Barrack locked in for NIP, trying to get that optimal point tank. Spirit. Damba to follow up. Feast Having the hit scan, ashes. long range shields are super effective. No other support really able to do that. Ying can too, but she's also immobile and can't really protect herself as well as a Damba can. So Damba, very, very valued support on this map. Wouldn't be shocked to see either a Genos or a Fury on the other side in terms of support. Genos, because he can play really safe, defend himself, and heal at a decent distance through walls. 
Furia because her heal range is massive and she can just do a jump heal. Accuracy doesn't really matter to keep them pocketed on the other side of it. And right. Furia with Cherish will be picked up. And a Nora for the point. So sure. Moonchopper's pick still open. It could even be triple DPS. It could be. Could very, very well be. You've got Leon, you've got May. Furia being hovered as well as a Nara. And usually looking at your support, you're looking at oh, your Genesis frontliner. Band. Yeah, and Genesis band as well, Oops. right? Which is typically why you well, which is why we're not seeing viral on it. It seems to be a strategy. I promise that the way I'm sitting has the laptop locking the Genesis band. <laughs> I can actually only see Renegades' bands unless I leaned up, so that's on me. And Nara Furia locked it. Furia wise. makes sense. Especially with the Genos band that I right. could not see, I promise. <laughs> The Cherish Shields are really going to be impactful. Jumping over the walls up top is a big deal. Also, you can play kind of behind cover. Whatever back lines NIP end up with really can't trade back against the damage coming on the other side. They could still even go Makoa, but that makes that opens things up to a Sky potentially from NIP, but I highly yeah. doubt we're going to see it on this map. It's yeah. almost as big of a problem as... Uh, yeah, I gotta go Makoa. Oh, they're going Trooper Frontline. Interesting. And that's definitely the way to do it, I think. With a buck. With that's a buck. such a tanky yeah, lineup. Very, very this might have to be a triple DPS from Renegades to be able to burn through them. Yeah. It's very, very durable. Or like, Huckus. Sure. Are you not entertained? But it's literally the Makoa. It's literally the buck. I mean, you've got a Maldamba at your back healing you and making sure that you're staying up, alive, and healthy. You literally have such a strong, strong possibility. And Willow, I like that. I like that a lot, especially with Damba. Especially because what's the answer? Right, exactly. What do they do to the Willow? They don't right. have any way to burn that. her out of the sky. Leon and Maeve, plus an Inara, very, very strong in the middle, getting pressured. Going to live through a lot of damage. My main goal is to blow you Willow's up. going to be locked I like in. That. I think like that's I really smart. Nobody. I think it's free. it's also very good for the buck, too. Yeah. Dead zone on the buck means that the bulk up only gives him the 300 bonus health, and sometimes that's not even worth it. For a talent. Right. I mean, which do you like better, man? I mean, is it the triple DPS or is it's it the triple It's hard to line? say. It is Timber it's still it close. is Timber Mill. I think on Timber Mill, I want to side with RNG, but I don't see them play triple DPS a lot. I, I mentioned right. this before. Last time they played triple DPS, didn't go very well. But I, it should theoretically be a comp they're great at. Moonshopper right. was a DPS. He looked better on DPS most of the time than off tank. Mm -hmm. You'd think they transitioned to that really well. It's been a struggle, but Moon's been playing pretty well this set. It yeah, could be what been. turns the triple DPS around for them. It can be. I mean, once again, a really tanky composition. You've got Maldamba as well that could be countered out by that Willow. I mean, it's looking good for both teams on paper, but how will they do in-game? Well, game five waits around the corner. Timber Mill. In Gormizer, we got a triple DPS versus a triple frontline composition. Normally, statistics would tell you a triple frontline wins these matchups more often. I think Timber Mill is dynamic enough of a map that maybe some stuff starts to get changed there. Oh, yeah. This map, it's not necessarily one where anything can happen, but it's definitely in that area of if you're going to try triple DPS versus triple frontline, we've seen one work maybe a little more than the other. Actually, I I'm thinking back to what was it? It was quad DPS, I guess, versus triple DPS Three. there. Two. That NIP One. ran the quad. The Navi ran the triple, and it beat him then. We'll see if triple DPS yep. can deal with this now. And it's also not only triple frontline, but also on Timber Mills, the only place Makoa could go a pick. Yeah, that was <laughs> interesting to see. Wait, he's not getting picked yet? Oh, wait, he's not in the band column. What's going on? And Timber Mill is why. I mean, if those hooks hit consistently, it's it you know changes the the kind of outlier of the game. That's where the problem lies. Part of the reason Makoa doesn't go so high priority here is where are you going to hook him from? I mean, look how distance this is that you're going to have to deal with, and that is Cat Burglar there. Surprise you to see that? Running. A little bit just because of the fact that, you know, I mean, you're looking at a 1,040 damage oh versus no. a pure execute oh at 35%, God. which technically, if you want to get into percentages, that execute is going to be worth more. But if no one's going to look at him, who cares? Uh, yeah, I don't. Invocal seems to be playing a sniper here. Apparently, he is up on the high ground, dealing daggers to anyone that'll catch him, and that's all of NIP right now. They're able to get one back, Shadow with two. And they bring up a good point on the desk in that, you know, Moonchopper is a comfortable DPS player. Yeah. So, this is a team that can absolutely play triple DPS to the top potential. Was picked up as a DPS this year pivoted over to being the off tank for the Renegades if you're trying to play catch up here. He <laughs> did not fill the role out very well in the first phase. There's no way to sugarcoat that one. Nope. As time went on, 
you can see him kind of growing into it. But yep. one of the strengths, and this is something I talked about, I think, at MSI, maybe even on Esports Weekly, but the one thing that I have always wanted to see out of Renegades was when Triple Frontline, or Triple DPS, sorry, was growing for them to do it because of that reason. Moonchopper yep. fills that role perfectly. You'd think they would be a great team at it. And well, as of right now, you can see, yes, they are, oh, but no. it's not really because of Moonchopper. Gormizer, I mean, we have been talking about Jeez. the Renegades for good reason, and Vocal has not missed many daggers, if any, throughout this game. He has three, looking for four. As I said, he misses that last little volley. But now we got to talk about NIP. They look completely disjointed. Yeah, they do not know what they're doing. And, and one of the biggest things, you come to this map because you're feeling confident. You don't just choose Timber Mill. It's not like they're yeah. scraping the bottom of the barrel right now. They are willingly saying this over Jag, over Brightmarsh, over some of these more popular maps. I mean, Jaguar Falls, the Renegades admitted it themselves the other day that it's not a good map for them. Right here, right now, Timber Mill, it's fallen right into their wheelhouse. Pretty good value, Faith Light. No kills, but lots of zone. Moonchopper from the high ground confirms the kill onto Bonker. Dancing around the point. That shell shield is going to expire, and wow, he's able to spin up to the high ground. Alex, the only damage dealer for NIP, goes down. Look at those health bars, a sliver on everybody. Are you able to capitalize? Not just yet, but now Shadow's rejoining the fight. Renegades go up two with a whisper. Barely that from NIP. I'll be honest, did not expect that one to go in when two front lines were still alive, one behind, one in front of the Renegades there. They were able to hold on to it. Diggy was even able to get a kill on to specifically in vocal, which has been probably the, the hardest thing to do. I feel like the conversation can float around. I'm still maybe unsure of where we're going to see it right here. Wouldn't have had the execute. Going for the extra damage that he's got has been better for him than anything. I mean, it's, again, a 1,000 that you're going to be dealing, 2,000 if you hit both sets, which as of right now, yes, he yes. is, versus you could argue maybe a 2,000, 2,500. Actually, no, it must be less than hitting both pairs for the execute. He probably did the math on it, crunched some numbers in his head prior said, I'd rather be able to slaughter anyone and everyone that stands in my way than itemize specifically for the front lines. Just to stay alive, NIP are going to drop that dome shield that's bitten her on the barrack. Might as well point this out. He has a great win rate on barrack for this NIP roster. Whenever they play triple DPS and a barrack is in the lineup, expect it to be bitten her. Overpower good onto Invocal. That's a big threat to get rid of Alex as well. Times Finds the right time to dive. Grabs the kill on a shadow. Now peels back, helps out the rest of his team. Just one more left. They're not able to get the kill into the buck wild. Goes Alex. Grabs one more. NIP stalled out at 54%. A double onto Hero. And for the first time this game, some momentum behind the blue side. And I think the biggest thing, well, Faith Flight actually coming out right now, which might be the more important note. That's going to be able to open this up. That's a dread server. That's clean from NIP. All right, Gore. So what did you see maybe that NIP chain? Oh, I mean, coming from a round with nothing going for them. How do they suddenly win a mid fight? All right, you ready for this? Hit me. They killed in vocal. <laughs> That's literally all they did. That's the only difference. Overpower, baby. He was eight and one, right? When we checked in with him after that triple kill, he's nine and four. He has gone one and three since that triple kill. That was kind of the highlight of last round. And man, you get rid of that Maeve, you get rid of his potential. We've said this a lot about the Renegades, but unless Shadow just goes completely bonkers afterwards. It's not going to change anything. It's this weird dynamic they have where sometimes it feels like only one of them is kind of allowed to hold the crown, right? And if that is the case, if that's one of the kind of breaking moments that, that ends up losing them maybe the set or the map, yep. you know you're going to be feeling that one all the way home. This is a big push. The Renegades are able to defend. We go to 3-1 here on Timber Mill, or it's tied. Hero as well. He's locked down there, but he gets a double kill. And you know, we've we've put so much focus on Invocal and Shadow this set, I think for good reason. I mean, that's always been the conversation around the Renegades, but I think the frontliners for the Renegades, Viral included, have stepped up today. Absolutely. I mean, I was even talking about Moonchopper earlier right now, three, four, and five. Not playing frontline, ignore him. Hero, I'll say it again, and I've said it before, he is on his best days. I would argue one of the best, like top two, top three, yeah. if not number one frontline. He plays so well when he's in the right zone. 
It's just trying to get him in that Good zone. Most of the time, though, obviously top nice eight. See play. What he can do. I love that play. He takes the teleporter up. Seismic crashes down. Three kills for Shadow. And the last two for the Renegades for Hero and Moon Chopper. Now, big zone potential. 30 seconds left. How far forward do you want to get? That's the question. Uh, looks like the answer is not far forward. <laughs> Got do you agree with that? Over there. I like how they're approaching it. I wish they had sent one more person. I think you could afford to put Shadow or Moon Chopper a little more aggressive. Go for dismounts. I mean, at that rate, you're slowing them down enough that they're barely going to get overtime. Even now, they're barely going to get overtime, but they've been able to kind of facilitate, formulate, figure out what they want to do when they get here. And you've seeded so much ground that they don't feel too stunned. Diggy Dog didn't see the beam coming, got stunned out, and now he has to back out. Still a chance, though, for NIP. Overtime slowly expiring. They will step back onto it. Inexcusable if you can't reset overtime with triple front line on your side. But they are able to do so. Walker getting just picked away, and Vocal thinks that this is the time to go. Doesn't miss a dagger. Doesn't make any mistake about that one. They burn the Ancient Rage. Diggy Dog uses the Ancient Rage here. He's the last man alive behind Bird. And now Moon Chopper chooses the time to strike. And what a turnaround that is. The Renegades are one point away from taking a 3-2 lead in this quarterfinal. You know, this thought just kind of cropped up when you mentioned triple front line and just kind of thinking more, kind of ruminating, I guess, over it a little more. NIP are the team everyone wishes they could be in this league, in Paladins, it feels like. Because if you think about it, and specifically Na'Vi come to my mind, you know, I have to pay respects <laughs> after uh, what happened earlier, but... They wanted to be able to play triple DPS, triple front line, yeah. standard compositions, Five, anything and four, everything at a high three, level. Two. NIP do that. They've been doing it all year. They have not had any hesitation to, to lean into these strategies. And thinking about that, it's very impressive if you can get a win over them, two here for the Renegades this set. But, I mean, you have to do so much to dismantle this team from the ground up. You could make a two-hour montage of just us saying the word flexible when doing NIP pregame segments, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. They need some of that right now. Shadow into the Faith Light, gets the kill onto Bird. A lot of sustain now missing from NIP, but into the Dome Shield they go. That buys them a little bit of time here. Moon Chopper kites backwards. Some good targets around the corner. Battle shout not long enough as the Enlightenment flies on through, gets the kill onto Bonker. Bittner down as well, good stun. Locks up Diggy Dog, a triple kill from Moon Chopper. Renegades in control with a chance to win. Exactly what he needs. If they get this point, they take the lead in this set. Not something I expected to yeah, see today. Yeah, pinch yourself. NIP, they're going to have to fight back on this one. They do have an overpower. That's at least one clean pick, but they have to be able to do a lot with it afterward. They have to open that door and then slam it shut in Renegade's face. Seismic crash as well for the Renegades. That could be big. <gasps> CC no, immunity. CC immunity. It misses. Overpower, no good from NIP. Seismic crash rains down. 99% for RNG. How long can you extend this fight into the Faith Flight? They go. Alex does find a kill onto Invocal. That's an important trade back. They're going to kite backwards. If nothing else, the Renegades have time. Only 54% for NIP. Slowing this one down with maybe an Inflame. Inflame, though, big swing in their favor. They have the Enlightenment back up as well. 1,600 first at the ready some with stunts. some immunity on it. It's going to be a lot to be able to come in. All you need is one kill. One pick opens this door, and there's Here's a lot the of little health bars on the side of NIP. Moon Chopper gets aggressive, but Hero, Moon Chopper go down. Yeah, Moon Chopper drops down to the low ground. It looks like NIP in a good spot to get their second point this game, and Vocal's going to have to go huge. And I mean four straight kills alone huge. That's a little bit too big a stage for this one. NIP, they survive after what looked like might have been a fourth point for the Renegades. I was absolutely ready to not only give Renegades the game, but to give Hero play of the game for that one. I mean, that ult perfectly timed to counter out the overpower, perfect to shut down and stop NIP in their tracks. It wasn't perfect enough. It didn't have enough kills afterward. It didn't come with enough of a hold for them. And then that inflame didn't quite hit, I think, the way they thought it was going to. It's a lot of damage, but it doesn't automatically do it. You have to get aggressive and you have to work together. That's a good cleave here for Shadow. Nothing else. This makes them jump backwards, stalls out this push just a little bit. Vocal with the kill onto Bittner. And this is dangerous, especially if you're NIP. If you're getting staggered out this heavily and this fight is occurring at the mid, NIP are going to be all the way back in their base by the time this gets reengaged. Oh, yeah. They are going to have to figure out what they want to do 
to get back in on this one. Dismounts are even looking to come through, trying to find some daggers. Oh, he hits hit one. one of them. <laughs> and, I mean, we were talking about him. You were joking that he was playing a sniper here. But it kind of feels like he is how many of these long-range daggers are Wait, connected. Wait, payloads. Payload's moving right now. Somebody is back on the payload. <gasps> he He's in behind. Mounted. If they're not, if they're not going to kill him, if they're not going to kill anybody, is he able to get through? Do they know he's back there? Looks no, like Furia don't. is kiting backwards. They do see him there. Wait, they're not turning around. They're not turning around. They don't see him. They're still fighting on the front oh line. Bonker still mounted up to tie God. the game. The back door on Timber Mill. He's still mounted. NIP against all odds. Tie this up. All right, now show me a Renegades player camp. That is what I want to see because I want to know what their faces look like because Bonker knows exactly what he just did. I mean, they've, they've got to immediately have been like, I'm sorry, what just happened? Yeah, Where I'm, were they? I'm thinking for sure Viral's going to see the Furia start to kind of dance around, dance backwards. He's going to turn around. But he was hiding. Like, he was just like, okay, keeping my vision. Like, oh, I need to <laughs> yeah, get to right. a better position. Let's go to go upwards. Wow. That's how you get 3-3. Three, three. Hero doesn't look too happy about that one. You can't be. You have momentum you really on your side. Him. How does he? How does a con mounted sneak through? Well, there was this awkward moment, and I can't think of a good way to explain this to stream without a diagram to draw it. And Nara was on one side of a tree when Khan ran by mounted. Okay. And th I don't go. think Hero saw. I don't think anyone saw. I think he slipped through in a very, very small moment that literally was maybe one slight yeah. mouse twitch to the left. And that got him there. Well, are we going to look back and say that that's the moment that changed the face of this set? Maybe. Renegades still have some fight left in them. Faith Flight, that's one good way to start it off. Gets the kill onto Bonker. Hero down as well, though. No more front line for the Renegades, at least for a little bit longer. Double kill from that Willow keeps them in this fight. Shadow around the corner from Alex. Things starting to slow down, but two kills on the board for the Renegades. Doing anything and everything in their power. The Faith Flight has been great. Well. They've got it as of right now. Good ancient kills. Rage. That's going to be an Ancient Rage to keep them in the fight, but it's not doing enough damage. In fact, he's taking too much in return. They burn him down. Kill, but the Shell Shield's good to keep him alive. Hero desperately moving forward, and once the shield expires, Diggy Dog does the same. NIP staying in it. Good overpower onto Invocal. Get rid of that Mave. That's been the win condition for the Renegades. Final kill here. 60% for NIP with a chance to zone. Midnight available. That is going to be pretty much the only ult that matters coming into this. Enlightenment. Play a big role. We saw it earlier. Can get you a triple kill. Can get you a double kill. One more. In the right position, damage immunity is That's great. Tough. But Moon Chopper's gone. That's tough. He had to slide down. You can see right around the corner there, Hero nearly in range. Smiles on the faces of NIP. You have to look back at that back door. That's it. And that's the moment that changes this game. And I think you can see that in the booth as well. They recognize if that hadn't happened, we probably would be winning this. Yeah. I mean, we were in control. If Moonchopper's able to get his ult off, even though I was ready to glance over Enlightenment, you hold that on the objective. You keep some of that time. Yeah. You're damage immune. It's like a kind of mini assert dominance, if you want to think of it that way, except it deals 1,600 damage when you're done with it. But they knew it was coming. They knew what yeah. to expect. They dismounted the Inara. And, well, as we saw with Bonker, dismounts mean everything. It's a win but it's a shaky win from NIP. Yeah. That was close. You know, a couple points, even that last win, even after the back door, this one goes the way of the Renegades. It's 3-2 to the Renegades. Not out of the woods yet. Renegades, they're being pesky today. They're hanging around in this set. Let's see if they can tie it up one more time on the other end of this break. I belong, I belong to you.
Well, well, in a surprising turn of events, NIP deciding to, pay, t- deciding to take a page out of Vex's book, actually, when he backdoored on Timber Mill, were able to even it up, clutch things out, and now they're 3-2 against the Renegades. This is what it all comes down to, the very, very last match. What could be potentially the last match? And I think the biggest thing about that backdoor that Bonker had was that it shows how focused RNG is, right? They were just right. so laser-focused on, on getting the fight, working on zoning them out because they were pushing so aggressively that no one thought to look up. Right. It happens. They had three DPSs. That's one person who's probably more focused on their crosshair mm. than they are on the objective hero, probably in a fight or something, and were not able to look up in time. Unfortunately for that last mid-fight, because I think they went into that last fight a little bit on edge yeah. from that for sure, and Volko gets hooked immediately. Hero does a great job saving him, mm. but at the end of the day, it wasn't enough to turn that fight away from NIP's triple tank. Yeah. Which I'm surprised that won in the late game more than anything, too. I am, too. too. Yeah, that definitely... You think what you you would think of going up against triple DPS once you got Wrecker, Cauterize, all of these items online that literally just benefit the DPS entirely. That's going to be pretty... I mean, you, you would think that that would sort of stamp the victory for RNG, yeah. but just so happens to turn around. And I mean, of course, where, 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 what, how will we talk about this without talking about Bonker? Like just from his performance on the con, along with the back cap, that back back cap that literally allowed them to win that game. Also, having a decent performance on con against the comp that Renegades had is not easy. Like you're against Willow, you're against Maeve, you're against Leon who's on the high ground the whole time. You're literally just getting shot at from a place you can't protect yourself from all the time. Great overpower too by Bonker. I think this is honestly what turned it around. If a vocal gets away, that's a midnight that yeah. they have to retake with that NIP doesn't really have a CCM unit answer for. So NIP. On the edge, they're yeah. right here, potentially able to go further than they've ever gone. For, they've ever gone in Worlds before. Mm-hmm. They could be on their way to semifinals if they can take Renegades' map. Yeah, and that's what's going to be important once again. I mean, this is Renegades' map because they were the ones that lost. This is going to be their pick, mm-hmm. and it's going to be important because if they don't, they go mm-hmm. home. If they do manage to do it, then we've got a three-three game seven. But once again, NIP looking absolutely phenomenal. I'm sure the morale has to be high, especially after so after being so narrowly close to winning. Honestly, I think it might be the other way around. I think NIP are feeling good about the win, but I think they're probably thinking, oh my god, Renegades are taking right. us this far from, you know, th- they're very confident they play like that, so I think they might honestly be in a worse headspace than you think. Bright Marsh and Jag both not picked, so we're going to Bright Marsh map 6. This, I think, is a decent map for Renegades. It can be snowball so if they start strong, they can keep the momentum in their favor. They managed to do it before on Stone Keep. Honestly, I think the map score overall... Maybe that 4-0 kind of swings it more in Nip's favor, but RNG are always getting a lot of points on the other maps, and NIP have kind of been struggling to get points on Renegades' maps. Indeed, they have. Willow's going to be the first ban. Genos follows it up with NIP on their side, and this is going to be see who they are going to ban on RNG's side. Will they try and get one of the power tanks? They will not. They will get rid of the Makoa, and NIP have no choice but to respond with the Atlas ban. Yeah, like they might let it through, honestly, because then there's a couple possibilities open for them. Okay. I want to see... What happens with, there's Strix, there's Atlas, there's Khan, all pretty important things. And right now, if Nip bans none of them, they'll get the other two. Strix and Khan in the face of an Atlas isn't ideal, but it's definitely not bad. And it's also putting Moonshopper into a pick that he doesn't really play too much. Atlas doesn't get through that often at all, and only a few tanks have really been fantastic on it. And that's what NIP want to do. They've seen great BK play from Shadow in close maps on the past. Renegades have to pick Atlas, and I would not be shocked to see Strix Khan almost immediately coming back from them. But... Might be Barrack Khan instead. Okay. Possibly just two shield Time heavy tanks. This mom. does leave Strix open for Renegades, but it takes away a character that Moonchopper's been crucial on. Right, exactly. I mean you've got rid you've got the Barrack, potentially got the Khan as well. And I'm glad that you mentioned that, Krasnik. Taking away this Khan, he Moonchopper's had such good performances on it. I mean, on Stone Keep, absolutely amazing with saving Hero's life within an inch of it. I mean, getting these overpowers, making sure that he's popping off. He, and you take that con away from them with the Atlas being on RNG's side, it's going to be really, really important. It's going to be, can Moonchopper pop off? Can Moonchopper try and make sure that he can actually win these fights or at least help out his team the best on this Atlas? Because RNG, I mean, they are going to lock the con, so they have more flexibility with who they want to go for their point takes, but it's going to be an R more than likely. Yeah, I mean, they're most likely going to be an R. Definitely a little, two stationary tanks, though, so they're not really able to get too aggressive. NIP are probably, honestly, they're probably just going to pick up Ruckus and go triple tank again. Realistically, I think it's just a pretty tough draft to deal with on this map. It's sure. definitely beatable, but I wouldn't be shocked to see Renegades pick a tank now just to try to take that away from them. But then if they take, like, the Ruckus or something to deny the triple tank, then they're making their comp just worse. In the long run, their, their comp won't be able to really keep up, so... 
Maybe just Sonara, but they're going to take... Buck. Buck. Okay. okay yeah. well, Cassie, makes, Cassie makes a lot more sense there, yeah. for sure. Buck there would be very oh, out there. Dang. Yeah. For sure. But Cassie's going to be picked. Cassie pretty solid against Triple Tank. You want that big game shred be to burn through all those large mental. health bars. Exactly. Atlas, Cassie, Furia. Three characters already picked on RNG's side. NIP, though. The Barrett Khan, they're going to have to respond in kind with, well, actually, what KU see here? I mean, they've got both of their frontliners. I would imagine it's going to be like a damage. Now, they have two support. of their three frontliners. <laughs> well, okay. Well, okay. well if, they're going to, if, they're, if they are going to end up going triple tank, then once again, you think it's going to be the ruckus that they're going to try and round things out with? Almost certainly. Yeah. I, I think it's better against standard comps than the Ash would be. I mean, it could still be Ash and have her be the really aggressive one. Ash, Khan, Barrick isn't a bad pairing, but Ruckus is a little bit better at taking a 1v1. He's really solid in that triple tank lineup, although he does get screwed a little bit harder by Cassie. That big game knockback percentage damage really is really strong into the Ruckus, so might not be the choice. If it's not the choice, then that, I think, is why. NIP, I'm assuming we're going to see a support. and It could be a support and a DPS here. And then, yeah, it's going to be Maeve and Domba. That, that makes Spirit me a little more curious if it will be triple DPS, uh, triple tank, excuse me, because Domba is okay at healing triple tank, but I think you'd rather have like a damage, maybe Welcome a Ying, better Street for like Kipling. raw healing. Also stacks a little bit with the CC now that they have the Mave as well. If they end up, they probably won't go the Ash now because that'll make the resilience even stronger against their composition and, and kind of negate their alt value in late game. It makes their comp fall off even harder late game if they end up with an Ash. Yeah, an RNG. Atlas, Cassie, Furia. That's what they've got so far. And how will they round things out on their draft? What could they potentially pick, crazy thing that you can see? I mean, well, one of them has to be the Yadnara, right? Do you see the, the other DPS? I mean, being an Eevee in this case, they've got rid of the Bomb King, so I mean, there's very little options they could actually go. And our Drogos could be an option. Drogos what? is pretty solid into Triple Tank as well, and it's not going to be bad into whatever NIP picks. If NIP ends up with like a Leon or something, I think you can still play around it on this map. So Drogos is, is a potential possibility. Or Shadow. Eevee also still available, having that, that flanker to trade into them. Eevee's also very good when boosted with the Inflame, so a lot of options for Shadow's pick here. Strix might go unpicked on Ben. That would shock me. This would also shock me. I, I hope that's think. not the case. What? And it is. Really? I think it's purely to be paired with the Atlas. But that blows my you mind that that's what they want to go here. with. Whoa, wait a hold on a second. That's purely to be paired with the Atlas. That's gonna go with the Beyond the Veil speed boost, and it's gonna walk at their flank. These, the CC is gonna make this very hard for them to deal with. Domba stun, con grab, all stuff that is going to just get the Talus annihilated. I, I, I really don't think he's gonna be able to last that long against the other composition. We'll have to see, especially when there's an Eevee on the other side. I guess Talus actually doesn't fare too badly against those flankers. Talus does so much damage so fast Holy that those crap, flankers man. will go down pretty quickly. Wrecker, once that comes online too, the Talus will do a good job at shredding them, but I don't know. I'm definitely very tentative on this Talus pick. It's going to be a lot of pressure on whoever's on it. And if there's yeah. any DPSs, that would make it work, right? It's going to be the DPSs on Renegades, whoever ends up on it, because it really could be in Vocal or Shadow. Both of them have played long enough that they've played in metas where Talus was, was being drafted. That was when he had Anti-Diluvian, though. That was, you know, Cauterize, <laughs> Cauterize 3 at start of the game. Right. Very different play style now. How many of them have been practicing it? I kind of want to go check their Paladins gurus after this to see <laughs> <laughs> who right. actually has any Talus playtime, but I find it so hard to side with the Talus on a, such a CC-heavy composition on the other side. I'm at a loss for words, so I'm just not going to keep it here on the desk anymore, man. I mean, Talus, game six. Here, take it, guys. Hey, thanks, Fawn. Game six, Renegades. They pick in uh, some some spice. We'll call it some spice, some interesting spice. They, uh, they bring Talus into their lineup for Bright Marsh. Krez wasn't a huge fan. Are you a fan, Gore? Well, it depends. Am I rooting for NIP? Uh, if I'm rooting for <laughs> NIP, I'm a huge fan of this Talus. I think it's great. It's exactly what they needed, right? Right. What but, NIP uh, needed. Yeah, what NIP needed locked in. I don't know what the what this is going to bring. This is going to be the best Talus performance we've ever seen. Just watch. It's I Honestly, it's in vocal. I would not doubt it. Inner Strength. So Rune of Travel, resetting the cooldown of your Overcharge and your Blitz up, or you get your punch, but who cares about the punch? It's really going to be his melt that comes through. And then a lot of focus, transient to get the cooldown. I love Guts, especially at four. Just some damage reduction to let him get into the back line. Man, if I'm having flashbacks to anything, I'm having flashbacks to, I believe it was game six of Envy SSG last year in the semifinal, where SSG ran the Talus, and unfortunately for them, they lost it here. 
I'm wondering, it must have been game five because they didn't lose the full set there. Then IP are looking at a win because this pick is out there. Oh, and IP are going to be able to tie up on the point there. First Blood went to the Renegade. Since then, it's been all NIP. You can see maybe in, in Vocal's thought process, just plug away some damage, but hasn't been able to really get involved. 66% in climbing for NIP. Vocal drops down. A rune of travel. Or doesn't just yet. Links back to it. 87% moving forward. Hero alone on the point. Nobody else there to assist. No more front line for the Renegades. 99% overtime started, but... They're not, they're not able to move forward. The kill's starting to cascade for NIP. Point number one on the board for Red. And the thing is, is nothing about the Talus is, well, neither positive nor negative. It's hitting the exact middle line of not doing really anything here. It's zero, zero, and zero. And, well, his damage slightly above middle of the pack. And honestly, it's just because... They don't care. I mean, if you're NIP, you're just not looking at him. They don't look at, they don't focus him unless he happens to step out from them. He's safe enough that he can get out of these fights, but their worst case scenario on NIP is, okay, we'll kill the Cassie. She's the threat. That's really what they've been able to lean on so far. Viral with the one lone kill here for the Renegades. And remember, this is a, this is a knockout game, potentially. If NIP win, they're going on to the semis. Renegades are going home. You bring out the Talus. And you know, if nothing else, it's been top damage on the team. Maybe just need a little bit more. How does, uh, in your opinion, length of game, does that scale better for, for Talus, for, for Invocal on this Talus? Do you think, you know, items online maybe make it easier to find some value? Honestly, going for, like, getting a wreck or two and then cauterize afterward, he'll melt the tanks. I mean, that's probably one of his best strengths. He does a ton of damage. I don't know if it helps or hurts Ooh. in either way. I mean, it's not really a good balancing wow. act. I think a lot of it's more how much can he enable the Cassie. I think Shadow, unless Vi uh, Invocal can turn things around heavily, Shadow's probably the one who's going to be the backpack for this game. That was a nice little sneaky play by Hero there. I couldn't quite see how many got stunned out. I think he knew he was going to die and tried to help out the rest of his team. As he's flying off the map, tosses out the seismic crash, and Renegades end up winning the fight. So at least a, a breath of life there from the Renegades. Now Invocal in a good spot to get one more kill. Rune links back to his Rune of Travel. Reactivates it, trying to melt through Bonker, but not enough damage this time around. If nothing else, they stalled out NIP. Maybe looking for one more fight. You can see kind of melting down some of that shield a little bit. Not too many items online for him just yet. Into the Dread Serpent, running away, and Vocal killed. NIP, one more time, we're going to get back to this payload. It's all around the overpower, the, yeah, overcharge cooldown. That's nice, going Alex. to make a big difference. Is when that comes through, it can melt anything and everything that's in front of it. Probably one of the best melts in the game, but you have to have that cooldown ready for you. Rune of Travel resetting it means you have it up more often. But if you get caught out without it or if you get interrupted, much like that Dread Serpent, you just can't do anything with the talents. Important fight here for the Renegades to keep this one close. Dome Shield goes down from Bonker. Rocket boots around, is able to make his way back and sustain. And Vocal finds the flank in behind Diggy Dog, who now dashes his way out. Bittner drops down. Bittner gets the kill, makes it two. Looking for a little bit more of a flank. Just needs a few more daggers, but three members of the Renegades are all that's left alive, and neither of them are frontliners. And NIP it goes the distance, goes to overtime, but they're able to grab their second point. Also, as much as we thought against Triple Frontline was the time to be a running Street Justice Maven, go for some executes. It's now. I didn't even glance at that because I was so enamored with the Talus. I just saw him pounce onto Anara and her die, and I'm like, well, that's not uncommon, but that was yeah. way too much health. Sure. And I saw the nice little UI that pops up whenever they get within the health threshold. So between the two of them, it's galore. Five, three, and six. His damage numbers don't have to match. It doesn't even matter for yep. him because his goal is literally just get them. Alex, either you get them low enough or I'll get them low enough for you. One of us is going to kill him, whether it's outright or with an execute, we'll be fine. And at 1-1-11 one, one, and 11 for both Bird and Diggy, and IP are feeling very comfortable, very confident. This, this Talus pocket pick, I don't know if it's exactly what Renegades were reaching for when they reached into that pocket does have the true power. It's going to be interesting to see when he chooses to use that. Deleted is in vocal up on the high ground. Shadow has to dodge roll backwards, gets the tumble reset, and is able to stay alive. But 
Somebody may be able to kind of jump on top of them and flame used for the Renegades to keep them in this fight. Shadow's able to turn the corner, finds a kill onto Bittner now as the rest of NIP backing off kind of on this backwater side and Vocal runs down Alex. They do have fast cap on their side, so depending on how well in control they are able to get here, IP are going to have a big uphill battle, but finally some life from the Renegades. More of it on how Hero and Mood Chopper, I think, adapt and what we see. Overpower still available. So that's a free kill if you can get the right person. Did get the grab, Ooh, got the viral. kill on the viral. I was thinking he'd go for one of the tanks to throw him off to get rid of the support. And that opens the door for you just as much. The tanks can't do anything here. The Renegades were only able to get to 50%. Still one more fight happening in this mid. Bittner taken low. Bittner dodges back. No kill onto him yet. Bonker, though, gets the worst of the trade against Hero. Good start to this retake from the Renegades. 84% is where NIP stall out. And Vocal going toe-to-toe -to -toe now with Diggy Dog. Alex turns around and grabs the kill, and now a little bit extra on a shadow. Good Dread Serpent as the Cassie goes running. 81% for the Renegades, but all the kills are for NIP. Once these last couple go down, Hero being the last of them. This looks like a good fight. True power, though, flies on through, and Vocal gets the kill. Looking to rejoin this fight. Could this be the miracle play? Rune of Travel back, 96%, becomes 99. That's the body block, the stun, overtime slowly expiring, but the Renegades score, they're here to fight. And they're doing whatever they can. That overcharge is doing everything you need to melt wow. through. Diggy Dog goes down. They're keeping it contested. Heroes low, though, so it's going to be a dangerous game to play if you're the Renegades. Yeah, who has to move in? Who has to dodge roll forward? And it's Shadow this time around. Two kills for Invocal moving into the back line. A good angle here. He's able to win this 1v1, looking for one more. Viral finds a shot over time. Wants so desperately to go down, but Bonker's the one who goes down this time. Battle shout for Diggy Dog, keeps him on the point, and Vogel at 26 health. He stays alive. Moon Chopper gets the heal. Overtime expires one more time, and the Renegades finish it on top. And they fight back. Now, I'm not ready to give it fully onto this Talus, but again, the items that are coming online are helping him out in terms of dealing with, I guess, what this is their biggest threat. They don't care about Alex here, even though he's 10-3 and 11. He, this Eevee's causing more trouble for them than anything. They're getting rid of the tanks. Diggy Dog is having trouble dealing with it. His shield goes yeah. down too much. He's having to play a little more cautiously than he did in the first round. So well played, well re-aggressed there by Renegades. Does kind of beg my question of, should that overpower from Diggy gone on to someone like Hero instead, try to get one of the front lines instead of the support? Or was it good enough to get Ow. viral after the inflame was used? Inflame is used right here. You can see the damage potential. Unfortunately, the battle shout's going to mitigate most of it. Good start to the fight fizzles out as NIP grab a few kills for themselves. And this is a, again, it's one of those two ones. Big momentum swap here, NIP can put Renegades on set point on season point with the defense here. The Renegades still some ultimates, though, to fight back in. That's the, the key phrase, fight back in. Just try to get back to the objective. Hadn't moved very far here in terms of payload push. My Marsh is a pretty short map, so you don't have to worry about closing the gap with a lot of time. But when it's, you know, entire set point, you yeah. want to make sure you are as far ahead of NIP as you can when you are fighting from behind. You want this payload to be almost at the base before going into overtime and having to fight the entire push for it. Vocal now is just trying to pull something for the Renegades. Good movement from Bittner keeps him alive. One more time, like a wave crashing against a wall. The Renegades move forward, maybe splash a little bit, but MIP stands strong. Look great for their third point. And it's Bittner right now that keeps coming I think a little bit bigger than everybody else in all of these fights. He just finds the right area, the right target at the right time. Good cooperation between him and the EV and the tanks that are allowing for executes or the lack thereof, maybe just finding skills outright, which a lot of the case, or a lot of the times has been the case. So once that comes through, it makes it easier to then deal with and make the call against Nanara, against the Atlas, to make sure they just aren't affected. You can see these brief moments where the Talus just kind of shreds through a couple members of NIP. Not able to capitalize to any kills just yet. Overtime is on. Payload is moving. Diggy Dog back in the back line gets the kill onto Moon Chopper. 
Shadow goes down as well. Now there's three members of the Renegades kind of grouped up trying to fight to stay alive. Alex with a double kill here and Vocals. Maybe going to be able to stagger out. Overtime is on. Payload's still moving, but now it's just Hero. He's against the world, and I don't know if there's enough delay to get the Renegades back. Point three to NIP. This is season point. The Renegades need to win three straight points here on Bright Marsh to stay alive. NIP, they need one more to move on to the semifinals. And that's some nervousness I think Gotta you be. see there. I mean, it is such a hard-fought battle from the Renegades here. End up just being another statistic for NIP if they lose. This Talus, more pressure, I think, than anything is sitting on Invocal's shoulders. I don't know who made the call for it in comms, but between them and Invocal, or Invocal if he's both, they're going to be yeah. feeling the pressure that this needs to perform, and it has to start now, or else it won't have a chance until 2020. It's heavy when you say it like that. Renegades, now's the time to fight. Overpower, good. Connects onto Hero. Off the map he goes. They're going to be able to fight back in a moment, but without their frontliner for 10 seconds. Looking for a trade back. Alex into the ice block. Viral gets the kill. So it's one for one trade here so far. 39% and climbing for NIP. Dome Shield down on the point, used by Bonker. Moon Chopper catches that trade. And now the Renegades trying to fight back in. Gore, that point is climbing for NIP. Holding around the corner. High ground might be in your favor, but you got to do something. 84 is Hero's where it back. stalls at. Hero already used Seismic Crash as well. You need a lot to make this keep going your way. And I don't 90%. Know if they, have it. they lost Hero. 96 and climbing for NIP. Moon Chopper trying to save the season for his team. Viral goes down. Dread Serpent sends him running. A double kill from Alex. Could punch NIP's ticket to the semifinals. One last final kill, and Vocal drops NIP. We'll see you in a week. They're doing exactly what they wanted to do. They came in, I think, more snags than they expected out of the Renegades Relief. to hold them true. And there was definitely Relief. some true fight in there where they were wow. worried that they were going to lose that set. That is, but Brian Marsh goes exactly the way they want it. I, I say relief because on two or three separate members of NIP, you see kind of this head back, like breath let out. They take you six games. Last time we saw these two teams play, that one went six as well. So big, big win there for NIP. You have to give a nod to the Renegades, the run they had through the qualifier bracket. They had everyone believing. They had everyone believing in this set. We're Macho, look back at that back door on Timber Mill. Does that maybe be a momentum shift in the entire set? Yeah, I genuinely was telling you after the game, I think if that moment doesn't happen, if you get Bonker dismounted way before then and you don't see him get that back door, I think Renegades win Timber Mill. I think they are up 3-2 yeah. and things change where we go next. But Bright Marsh, the Talus pick, maybe on the back of whatever happened with that back door. Things just didn't line up for them. They, yep. NIP kind of started the dominoes falling over, and they got what they wanted. If nothing else, we've learned on any given day, any team can win. Na'Vi, they learned that the hard way with a loss to the Knights. Yeah. NIP, close call with the Renegades here. This one goes six, but the higher seed this time wins the day. Desk, take it away. Thank you guys so much for passing it down from the Castles booth. Great job on the call, as always. And, yeah, I mean, I guess the Talos pick is the thing it is that we have to sort of have to talk about, even if it's just very briefly. I mean, I saw the utility there. I mean, they were melting people, but I just don't think it was enough. I think it was too squishy. Yeah, there were some moments where that I think better communication could have fixed things up, too. At one point, he was holding, I think it was on the second mid-fight, he was holding a little bit back, and then I see Bird slither in the back line for basically no reason. He, he slithered just to rotate. And I think if someone had heard that, if someone had called it just, Domba no slither. That's a free true power mm. for sure from the Talus. That's a dive. That's a diveable target that he could have taken down. Yeah, the true power helped him with the retake a little bit later. But getting that pick on the Domba could have kind of flipped it against them. Right. I eventually saw the merit of the May VV too. I, right. Originally, I was like, oh, those are terrible matchups against Talus. Mm. But it's just more the rotation potential, right? Mm. Talus dives someone. Your Maven Eevee can be there to pounce on him in an instant. I mean, also the. I mean, also more than anything, the street justice made. I mean, I think that if you guys. That was a big part of it, yeah, too. Yeah, it was a very, very big part of it. I mean, that put so much pressure onto Hero, made it harder for Moon Chopper to do what he needed to because Hero was like standing on point and he's like just dead, snapped all away. But once again, Alex, super, super good throughout this match, doing absolutely phenomenal on this Eevee, really, really showing the power of Double Fun. I'm always happy to see Alex do well on Eevee, too, because there was a period where they just didn't pick Eevee. 
Like, for whatever reason, they had the choice to pick Eevee, they would just purposely ignore it. I think it definitely is comp dependent for NIP. I think they prefer Eevee when they have a strong healer, so they can reheal during the ice block a little bit earlier. But it's a good fit for them. I think their style, the way they like to play. And Tealax do well on it, especially on a map. A game as close as this, I think, is a big deal. Yeah, I think that is more than anything. Congratulations to NIP, of course, for being able to fight that one. But also, shout outs to the Renegades, dude. I mean, that was a close set through and through yeah. regardless. I mean, they definitely showed their growth. They've been doing their thing, man. And, of course, we got to give them props for that. Yeah, that's definitely a big growth for RNG. S sucks for them that they go out in the quarterfinals, but I think they had a good showing in NIP for the first time moving on to the World Semis. Well, of course, since they are the winners, we're going to toss it down to an interview and hear their thoughts on the match. Time for NIP down here. You guys are confirmed now to the semifinals, playing in a week against the winner of our next matchup. Uh, close set. I mean, by and large, it's a, it's a very close one. Goes six games. Did you expect the Renegades to bring this? They had, you know, all in all, a, a pretty decent week throughout qualifiers. Did you expect this one to go six? Honestly, I kind of did. Like, they've really showed up in the past two, three weeks, honestly. Even in scrims, like, I don't think we really played to our best ability today, but overall, they've been picking it up right when they needed to. Unlucky for them, though. <laughs> so you're on Timber Mill. We'll run it back for a second. They've got a pretty pretty good defense going for themselves, at least it's what it looks like, and all of their players seem to be aware of it. And then one lonely con just happens to make it through. Like, what moment did you realize, wait, I can backdoor this? Like, how did you know that that was going to be the play? I said it like I was hiding on Mount inside of the house as they were wiping us. And I said, as they were moving up, like, I'm going to backdoor this. They're not going to check this corner. Because I bought Master in two in spawn because of that purpose. So I walked into that room, and they walked up super deep. And I called, like, 10 seconds before I, I even touched the payload, I called, I'm going to backdoor this. Just don't kill them. Diggy even hooked the uh, Fury, and we called, like, don't kill the hook, hook target and stuff like that. So We were baiting was, really hard yeah, to think was. we want to take the fight, but we're not actually trying to kill them. Yeah. Well, there was a moment I thought Viral for sure was going to turn around. The Furio kind of backed up from the fight and just didn't pay attention, and you guys were able to push that one in. Do you consider that maybe a, a momentum shift in that set? I mean, it's a very close game. The Renegades are up you know, pretty big on Timber Mill. Do you kind of feel a momentum change there for you guys in the moment or all around just kind of cleaner play on that last map to clean things up as well? I mean, I think that got us a little more hype, to be honest. Like, when that happened, like, all our motivation just went up like instantly, you know, like getting back doors in Pro League is not easy. So I guess it helped us. And I don't know, I would hope Renegades didn't feel too bad about it because it happens, but it helped us. So I want to know the, the last thing really in vocal, they lock in this Talus. What was your mindset at that? Was that like a yikes? Like I saw a little like, I think we had a camera on Bittner and he was just like, I'm sorry, what's going on? Yeah. yeah. Was there just confusion? Were you excited because you knew you'd be able to close it out? No, I mean, we practiced against it when I did the exact same comp, so we were <laughs> aware of it. That we, that we were going to pick the Talus, it was kind of expected, to be honest, so... Well, you expected to caught me off guard. You handled it either way. Looked good. You guys get a 4-2. You're going to the semis. Bonker, you're looking at a chance to potentially try and go back to the finals and find <laughs> another one. Diggy. You're trying to rise up and do whatever you can for this land. Congratulations. Prepare for the next week. Thank you. And thank you for your time. Thanks, man.